What is going on, everybody? It's chaos already, but it is episode 565 of Pop Culture Crisis. My name is Brett, and I am here once again with my co-host. Would you introduce <laughs> yourself, please? Hello, Crisis Actors. It's Mary. Happy Friday. Obviously, as you can tell, we have a returning guest on the show. The last time you saw him was from our Christmas special. Hey, guys. Yuletide greetings, Aiden. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's Yuletide greetings in March. <laughs> late, uh, late your, greetings. Your memory is I, you Ides of March tide <laughs> greetings. <laughs> Well, I looked back because I was like, I don't know, are we inviting him back too soon? Do we seem de desperate or, you know? <laughs> I think you guys just like me. No, yeah. I think you do. just, you know. And Our back. chat likes you, yes, most importantly. Do. Plus, I mean, I'm pretty, right? Like, Good Well, we also have guys. another pretty guest, Ian <laughs> Crossland. Oh, thank you. Most thank loved you. coworker. Thanks for having me, everyone. Let's do this. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, it has been. How you doing? Good, man. Doing good, good to see you. Yeah. How long has it been? Uh, a while. Five I mean, months, something like that. I think Four or five months. The last time, like he was going to be on, like James O'Keefe was in town, and he's like, I want to go jam. With oh James yeah, <laughs> I, I forgot like, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. There's at least one schedule. I think I was on that time too. <laughs> Wait, really? Okay, we've been trying to get you guys on, on one episode. Yeah. Like we've been trying to set you up. Yeah. Awesome. I seriously do think that one of the, one of the times I was here. You were supposed to be on, and then you were going to go play with, yeah. If it was no, late, yeah. late December, that was the OT. It, it was. Yeah. It was late December. Because I, I remember walking in, and I was. I remember you and I were walking in, and I yeah. looked up over to the other entrance. I was like, is that James O'Keefe? Yep. <laughs> it happened to be that day. Yeah. yeah. There you go. It's quite there a you day. Go. Uh, we could have had James O'Keefe on. He could have just dressed up in something and pretended <laughs> to be someone else, and nobody would have ever known who he is. Just sit in the corner or something. <laughs> Apparently, the number of people who, like, he just walks up to, and they don't recognize him, and then they tell them all of their state secrets is yeah incredible kind of crazy uh guys before we get started would you please hit the like button on this video and subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already please and thank you uh remember to share this video with your friends so that more people can come in here hang out and watch this show live we want more people to hang out here we want more people to watch also remember also we're lonely chats. we are we I, I get lonely yeah of course so like seriously, some days it's just up here on Monday and Tuesday, it's just me and Mary. We get lonely. You need to Leave come here and comment. hang out. Yes. Uh, all super chats, twenty dollars and over. We will interrupt the discussion. Yeah. We will read those super chats right then and there. Perhaps you have questions, concerns, comments for Ian or for Aiden, and you want to ask them something. All super chats, twenty dollars and over. Read them right then and there. Keep it as esoteric and conspiratorial as possible, please. Which is going to be one of the things we're going to talk about today. So guys, there's this old video. Okay, it's a <laughs> resurfaced video of Jim Carrey doing a comedy bit on Jimmy Fallon where he talks about the Illuminati. Now, he is being tongue-in-cheek, but the video is making a resurgence now as people have cut it down and edited it. And there's also some other things about him coming out from old videos of him from Norm MacDonald, old things of him on Larry King where he's talking about vaccines. It it's was just all, getting weirder and weirder. It's all getting very interesting. So we're going to go through it. I think it's kind of an interesting time capsule into a time before conspiracies were as... Uh, Trendy, yeah, trendy, but also as divisive as they are now. Like yeah. uh, they're they're more they're so publicly divisive now that you can't like just look into a good old fashioned conspiracy theory the way you could back in the day. So we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the future of dating, which is of course AI dating apps and physiognomy dating. Apps. You said the future of dating, so we already knew it was going to be bleak. Yes, very very bleak. Uh, you are now going to be able to use artificial intelligence to find your significant other. Every day I wake up and the 80s conspiracy theorists are right. That, the current ones, not so much, but the 80s ones, they, they were on. They were more, they were more dedicated. Yeah, they, they were, were dedicated. They, they gave us realistic <laughs> stuff like AI powered robots are going to cause problems. And, and apparently nobody listened. Apparently not. So we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about an interesting article where actor Brian Austin Green goes into detail about how back in the day when he was on 90210, he would uh, have to watch his girlfriend do sex scenes with other people and that would bother him, which is very interesting because it flies in the faces of a lot of the narrative in Hollywood, which is that it shouldn't bother you, it's all just work, compartmentalize, all that stuff. There's a whole bunch of stories coming out, all kind of related to stuff in the sphere. So if you guys are ready, we'll just go ahead and get started. Ian, I'm ready? ready, dude. He's ready. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Good? But yeah, Let's go. I'm here. Uh, first things <laughs> first, there is a little bit of a, a dark side to start the show, but I do want to mention it. Dragon Ball creator Akira Toriyama, he, uh, he passed away at the age of 68. Now, you um, said there was some crazy rumor okay, so <laughs> about his death. There's a, there was a couple things that went on. First of all, if you want to know how important this guy was mm -hmm. uh, in, in his creations, uh, China actually made a comment on this. Uh, China actually, The government of China actually spoke on this and offered their condolences to Japan. Wow. 
talking about the importance of this guy's work and his art. But also the other conspiracy that was going around, there was a, a Twitter post that got made from a troll account that said Mexican cartels uh, I did initiate see that. ceasefire in honor of Akira Toriyama. I saw one for Crips and Bloods too. Yes. So, <laughs> but what but is, is that because like Mexico loves Dragon Ball? They, they love or? they love manga, uh, right? It, like I, I wasn't I aware know. of this at all. I am so outside of the Japanese like media sphere yeah. that I like I've seen a Godzilla movie and that's about it. But um, it, it I watched Pokemon uh, yeah, as a kid. I know next to nothing about it. But it's interesting to see, like, now because of the internet now, you see the weird ways in which somebody's influence now um, can be shown, right? It's no longer just nice articles being written by someone. It's the memes that get made in someone's honor or the stories that get made in someone's honor. The internet will find its own way to show love to someone. In a story like this, even though it's not true, it's to show you the in, the impact mm -hmm. that somebody had on a culture. Hopefully yeah. that's not lost in translation as the Oppenheimer yeah. memes Yes, were. of course. What? Wait, what? You know, the, the Oppenheimer memes that offended all of Japan and they oh, were wow. like, how would was... you feel if we made memes about 9-11? We like, we're and we were like, like America, that would be hilarious. Like, yeah, you, you guys really do not understand how things work over here. Yeah, <laughs> America exactly. is the greatest exporter of 9-11 memes there are. And nihilism and yes. irony like and just a, stuff a like movie, that. A Japanese movie called like uh, Bin Laden. And it's just all <laughs> also, about Osama's life. They, they're life. offended about it's entirely work. the wrong thing. People are taught in high school that the greatest president of all time was the one who put Japanese people in camps. FDR. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think I think we've we've maybe maybe Japan and America need to have some conversations. So yeah. This is what the this is what the Chinese foreign minister said. Said uh, China is deeply saddened by the passing of Japanese manga artist Akira Toriyama, whose work is very popular in China, and extend condolences to his family. Uh, I mean, it, you know, great art brings people together, even even China and Japan. It sounds like the members of the CCP are big Dragon Ball fans. That's what it is, right? They're very all like, like, oh, I love that show. <laughs> I love the idea that Xi Jinping just has a big Goku poster. You know he does. <laughs> he's got he's got a poster that says Dragon Ball G. Yes. <laughs> yes. Probably got his own propaganda art made. Oh, better. Uh, I, I I wouldn't doubt that. Get one made. All right. Uh, so there's uh, there's other weird news going on in Hollywood. There's going to be a movie about Pop Tarts. The, like the food Pop Tarts. We initially reported on this, and I almost forgot about it, but. Apparently, Hugh Grant is playing Tony, Tony the, the Tiger. I don't know how that really... I mean, I guess they're bringing in all of the mascots from all the different cereal brands. He said it's like the only thing he's auditioned for in like 20 years. He wanted to play the Tiger. Somewhere. But it's like, Hugh why does it Grant? matter that it's Hugh Grant when he's in the mascot suit and no one can see that it's Hugh Grant? It's going to have dark British humor to the, to, the, to the tiger. Also, Jerry Seinfeld is producing it. Yeah. Uh, we're in a we're in a weird era yeah. for like like if you're not going to the big budget movies right we're in a really weird era where last year there was a movie <laughs> made around the creation of flaming hot Cheetos uh, yeah there was a, there was a movie about the creation of BlackBerry yep um there was the founder of the movie about McDonald's Tetris yeah uh, which apparently um, every like apparently from whatever what I've heard I didn't see it. Everyone that I've talked to that I trust about movies said the Tetris movie was like one of the best movies of all. I did hear it was so very weird. good. Yeah. <laughs> so like we're you're kind of in a golden age where if you can get the funding, you can get something made about a really really esoteric topic right mm -hmm. now. Like in the the person who created Pop Tarts just passed away like mm -hmm. a month ago. Oh okay. Yes, William Post. Damn, he never got to see it. R he never got to see the finished product. Yep. Uh, and Mary did have uh, strong feelings. She said anybody who doesn't. Toast you better the, toast them. You better toast your yeah. pop-tarts. Yeah. You I was more of a toaster strudel kid. No, those are gross. I found I found pop-tarts to be a little bland. No disrespect to Mr. Post. <laughs> <laughs> You're dishonoring his name. We weren't allowed to have him in the house. <laughs> yep. That same. Yeah. That's that's Once why I, I like pop tarts 18, or, I could, uh, I toast so much. Yeah. Mary, do you want to explain to these gentlemen about the Matt Rife situation? <laughs> Yeah, so... Because we have an update. What is, is the Matt Rife situation? There's another comedian named Ye Nima... What is it? Nima Yamini? Yes. I, I, I don't know if that's his real name. But anyway, he made a video where he claimed that he was in a contract meeting with a couple of Hollywood executives alongside fellow comedian Matt Rife, and they were both offered the opportunity to have online stardom, as he put it, in exchange for doing a certain type of favor for the executives of a sexual nature. And I believe it. 
His claim is that Matt Reif, before this guy could even get to the exit, Matt Reif was simultaneously performing fellatio on both executives at once. And he said, if someone is more successful than you, it doesn't mean they're better. They might just be gayer. So Matt Reif saw that Dom Luker posted this video and he was like, bombshell report. And he blocked Dom Lucra, and they were like, "Well, you didn't deny it, so now you're now you're sh- shooting the messenger, but you're not denying the message." Yeah. And now <laughs> Matt Reif is <laughs> reportedly exploring legal action against this comedian for the fellatio allegation. I mean, so what pretty- does that say about the credibility of the allegation, yeah. if anything? Well, if he's suing him for defamation. That's the very clear statement that he's saying it didn't happen. Yeah. But also this guy is a comedian. Like he has an easy excuse that this is a comedy bit he's doing. Yeah. I don't know. I, I would I would be I would not be surprised if the situation was like that he that that something of that nature happened, but <laughs> Maybe certain parts of the story were embellished. It was very, it very clearly came off as a joke to me. Yeah. But the problem is, is for, for Matt Reif is like, look, a lot of people aren't going to take it that way. Yeah. And all they're going to read is the headline. You don't even need to see. A lot of people won't even watch the clip that the dude made, which is very clearly done in a joking manner. But all they're going to read is the headlines that have been made <laughs> by people kind of accusing him of this. So he might feel like he has to take legal action. Yeah. That, like, I will say that's I, I would make a, a joke of that nature about my friends like but these guys aren't friends yeah. that's the problem yeah. yeah like being a comedian i don't know if that justifies defamation i don't think it does and especially defamation per se which is like the next level of defamation where it's like if you call someone a murderer or a rapist or say that they have a sex uh, an std mm-hmm. maybe saying that someone performed oral sex on some dude is also defamation per se well yeah. also remember who, who was the comedian that we talked about who law who got his uh, special he lost a job because he was lying about david his, lucas right? no 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 before this the, Wait, the guy no. who was talking about racist events in his past Aka- it wasn't akash singh was it or uh who was it the comedian where he was talking about no. like he was going to prom and his parents wouldn't and the oh, parents of the girl oh. he was going to prom with wouldn't didn't what want him was going with that somebody guy's was, name i can't remember his name uh, chat will remember his name, but I don't remember it. But he the like point is, the he, lost, he lost out on a job because they found out that the stories that he was telling, even though they were jokes, were not entirely true. But they weren't Weird. framed as jokes when yeah. he told those uh, stories because okay. he was framing himself as a victim yeah. and making a joke out of it. And gotcha. then a bunch of people dogpiled the, the perceived perpetrators on... Like once they remember, found out who it was. Does anybody remember Hassan Minaj? That's Hassan his, Minaj, that's yes, his name. Thank exactly. You. I was like waiting for some, somebody somebody's gonna man. remember it off yes, the top. Yes, yes. Uh, he was he was gonna get a, sh- a job on like the Daily Show or something. Yes, right? the Daily he, Show. Mm-hmm. What happened? He was saying that he had been. He had like he stories. was telling all these stories about how he grew up in racist America and post 9/11 America and all of this stuff. Like there was a an FBI honeypot that went to his his mosque and tried to recruit. Uh, other like like him and other Muslim guys that he knew, or the story about like powder being sent to his house. Yeah, it was all lies. All those were lies. I'm pretty sure they proved like that. Yeah, he he was lying, but he he was like, oh, it, it was just me telling a story and embellishing based on what other people have gone through, which is a form of comedy, right? But the problem is, is people aren't going to take it that way when you pass off grievance stories as your own. Yeah. I I gotta be honest though, one of the quotes. Uh, in here from him is really funny. I had to go head to head with one of the most dangerous organizations in the world. He added, adding that he didn't mean the U.S. military or the Israeli Defense Forces. I am talking about a white woman with a keyboard. That is funny. <laughs> Who said that? Was that Hassan Minhaj. <laughs> So we'll have to wait and see what Matt uh, what Matt Reif does if he ends up filing lawsuit. But it Mary, doesn't make him look good. It does not make him look good. And he doesn't have the best reputation to begin with. It, it's so. very easy to come out and say I did not fillet to executives, <laughs> and stop yeah. it there because if you say I did not fillet to executives during <laughs> a contract meeting, or just leave a comment with a laughing emoji. Yeah. Like, yeah. Everyone else is laughing. Yeah. They're laughing with you, not at you. Mary, you're going to have to tell everybody the story about the eight friends living in, in, <laughs> in a, uh, wait, in a, in a mall. Yes, there is a new documentary coming out about eight dudes who built a secret apartment inside a mall. And 
it looks like they're just a bunch of pretentious artists and they didn't they weren't actually homeless but this did really happen at the Providence Place Mall in Rhode Island back in the 90s. And now Jesse Eisenberg is producing this documentary about them. Remember when I said that it's a golden era to make a bunch of weird stuff? Like yeah. this is the era to make weird weird media. Yeah, so they, they constructed a makeshift apartment complete with a sofa, TV and video game system, microwave and a cinder block wall hidden above the shopping complex's garage. And they tapped into the mall's electricity to run their appliance. And it went undiscovered for four years straight until security finally picked up that they were living there. Like, I wonder if that security guard just felt like the man, the one who finally picked up on all this. No, you probably just feel like you failed at your job. <laughs> the, well, it depends on how long he's been there, right? He's like, yeah. wow, I've been here all four years that you guys were living above this mall. But the, you said that they also, they're making this about race now too. No, it's like they're really trying to make something that could just be a funny human interest story into a story about like racism and gentrification. How? Uh, because these men are white and okay. they're claiming that this is really proving they didn't have to fear police retribution because a black person couldn't have gotten away with making a secret apartment in a mall i don't even know they're saying this story is a trojan horse where you go in expecting one thing and it completely subverts your preconceptions as you watch it you hear the premise and you're like oh this is going to be like one of those crazy prank movies but it's using that to explore deeper ideas about art as well as gentrification and how we're living in the shadows of corporations yeah it would have it would, it would infinitely be better as a comedy movie <laughs> right right <laughs> like this is the problem with the self-importance of Hollywood, too, to feel like they have to speak on every single story as if there's a greater meaning to it. There isn't always a greater meaning. Sometimes it's just an interesting human interest story. And then Jesse Eisenberg added, what's so interesting about this film is the way it becomes this larger discussion about housing, gentrification, urban development, and class and race as these artists contemplate their own privilege. They're allowed to do something on a lark without the threat of heavy policing. What it was also was the in? 90s in Rhode Island. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I found this interview they did with local news from 2007 about the apartment, which has since been deconstructed, unfortunately. They, they should, should have, have kept it there. Yeah. yeah. Like to make money off of it. Could have been a great B Airbnb. <laughs> Could have been an escape room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but let's, let's take a look at this right. interview they did. They definitely seem like a bunch of pretentious artists. <laughs> They set up house in the most unlikely place. Providence resident Michael Townsend and some fellow artists transformed a 750 square foot storage space inside the Providence Place parking garage into living quarters with television, sofa and dining area. They even built a cement block wall with a door. Awesome opportunity for us to sort of try to make a domestic space in the mall <laughs> to really sort of test the our, our own notions of what mean <laughs> what a home means so so and his friends have used the space for nearly four years undetected by you can hear him trying to come up with something pretentious to say monitor it but if there's seemingly no uh, apparent uh, disruption or damage uh, <laughs> you, you wouldn't think twice about it because apparently it's in a remote area so how did townsend come upon it townsend says he first got the idea back in 99 when the mall was being built he would walk by every day and notice the construction he realized that this space was being created and said he remembered where it was i just sort of explored the exterior of the mall and found entrance to it <laughs> and was really sort of delighted and shocked to be able to gain <laughs> he was delighted. to it. Sort of. Last week, mall security finally the way he discovered what he had done, and Townsend was arrested. I'm calling oh, out the comfy. clothes are so awesome. It's just the most... All right, sorry. It, looks like a, it looks like a sitcom. One dude's getting home from his job as a programmer. The other dude is in a band. This guy skates. Like the, this is a TV show waiting to be made. It's got right? nothing to do with gentrification. Come on. That's what I'm saying, man. Exactly. No charge of breaking and entering. There's a bunch was of reduced ska music playing in the background. It wasn't strictly about undermining the mall. It was more sort of about putting something that's not normally in the context of the mall into the mall. 
piece of art imitating Bro, it was about you and your friends trying to get cheap rent. Bro, you need a place to live. This, all these TV interviews are them just trying to avoid getting sued. It's literally like, this is the definition of it's not that deep. It's about like putting something that's not normally in the context of a mall, in a mall. into the mall. No, dude, don't, you gotta understand, it was art, man, not <laughs> not <laughs> us do, no, squatting. Like <laughs> We got a $20 here from Raynor Chen. Hassan Minaj reiterated the truthfulness of his racism story multiple times and did nothing while his rabid fans harassed the white girl and her family who married an Indian man. Worse should come to him. Yeah, he definitely contributed to her okay, family yeah, getting harassed. If, if that's a detail I was not aware of. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we have a $50 from Mr. Anderson. Ian is the best person to have on the show. What are some of the craziest places to live? A mall doesn't sound so bad. No, sounds awesome. Can you no. kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Especially when it's an art project, you know, and you're just trying to like put something into a mall. Also, none of them were homeless. For the record, they all had other places to live. Was they were just, wait. this was a hangout spot for them. This so these guys fun. basically just built like a man cave in a secret room of a mall, and now it's trying to be a story about racism? Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. Kind of, I, okay. I'm almost, I almost have to applaud the creativity. So there's like, <laughs> there's like a, a BMX movie from the 80s called Rad. And in this movie, like the the four main characters, the three main characters, they like all hang out at like a lumber mill, like that's like their crew hangout spot. And they're in like it's kind of it looks like one of those um, uh, buildings where the contractors have their offices. And it's almost like it was abandoned, and that's like where their stuff is. And there's like a a bike cop who comes in and like he like races with them, but he's like a he's like a friend of theirs. He's uh -huh. not a friend, but like he kind of has like a thing where he races them around the mm -hmm. lumber mill. And I'm just picturing that now. Like, where's yeah. the security to kick them out of the lumber mill office? We need Paul Blart on this. We do. Stat. <laughs> Mall cop. We do. Yeah. Like, do a Paul Blart sequel with the secret mall yeah, apartment. Yeah. Exactly. You just know what they did too is like they went out and they got yellow vests for when they were laying the brick down. Oh yeah, because we do that. Like when we would go and when we we would cut skate stoppers off of rails and and <laughs> and, and rub brick ledges, you just get like a hard hat. And, yeah, and invest. And well, they much get away with anything. in the documentary they talk about these awkward situations where they had to move furniture and construction supplies through the mall into their secret apartment. <laughs> it's like, and it's the principle that if you walk in anywhere with a ladder, they'll let you in. They will. They will. Nobody's much. gonna ask you why you're bringing a couch into the mall. Yeah. <laughs> and no security guard is paid enough to think about it for a right. second. Like, <laughs> the, the greatest part of this, of this whole movie will be the scene where the security guard doesn't even mean to go in there. He, mm -hmm. like, he's just, it's his first day on the job and he's lost and he opens up and he's just like, uh... And then he just leaves. And just mind like, your business. Yeah. Also, like, if you did come across it, you might think it's some sort of break room. Yeah. For, like, yeah. some section <laughs> of staff. He's, like, talking to his manager later. He's like, yeah, and I saw those guys in the break room down in the, in the roof. I don't know why there's a break room in the roof, but it's, it's really, really, uh, like, they were all up there. He's like, break room in the roof? What the hell are you talking about? Also, in the video, in, in the news interview, didn't the one of the security guys say, like, we knew it was there and we were monitoring it because they hadn't caused any property damage? He said if, if they hadn't caused property damage, they wouldn't be able to, there would be no way to find, detect them. Yeah. Got but it. They had, okay, I see. Yeah. So that's the idea, right? It's like uh, low profile, don't get, no loud parties. Mm -hmm. You guys can't have any ragers Just in there. Just tea parties and video <laughs> games and good wholesome fun. I like the idea they're all hanging out and he's like, turn it down. But okay? the blocks are pretty good to block sound, so. <laughs> It's it's so ridiculous. All right, uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's move on, shall we? That that story is about as ridiculous as something gets right now. And Joe Rogan had something unbelievably ridiculous happen to him recently. So he had on a guest named Sheldon Johnson who wanted to okay. talk about the unfair nature of the criminal justice system in this country. He had previously been convicted of crimes and now was a uh, an advocate for prison reform. Well, that gentleman who was just on Joe Rogan a couple months ago or a month ago <laughs> was found with a, uh, a head in a freezer. Yeah. He just was... a month after he was on the show. Oh. He was just arrested yesterday after police found a severed head and limbless torso in his apartment. The victim's neighbors reported hearing, please don't, I have a family. Amazing you, timing. Guys. Amazing oh. timing. Can't make a segment out of this one. Out of context, people are like, why are you dancing about the guy? With no, no, no. You can absolutely <laughs> make a segment out of this. Yeah. <laughs> Beheaded person. Yes. Uh, oh, boy. So, so here's the clip of, of him and Joe Rogan. We'll just watch the first part of it. I, I need my money. I'm just, just, it's just me being honest. This is just being straight. You know, I gave you something 
And we had an understanding that you were gonna pay me. And when I came home, when I finally located this particular individual, he had his girlfriend with him. Um, and this guy owed me $5,000 for some drugs that I gave him on consignment. I gave him an eighth of, uh, an eighth of a kilo, which is 125 grams of cocaine. Um, and when I saw him, he had a bunch of jewelry on. He was with his girlfriend. She had a bunch of jewelry on. I said, hey, man, where's my money at? Oh, yo, I was going to pay you. And as far as I was concerned, his jewelry was, we was even. So I robbed him. And I took his jewelry. And his girlfriend happened to be there. And um, unfortunately, she got caught up in the situation. I had a bunch of young guys with me. And they robbed her as well. And he got hit in the head with the gun right here on the side of his head. And he got two stitches. And they gave me 25 years for that case. Okay. So he got 25 years in prison. He's wording it okay. like, oh, he he got hit in the head with a gun. Yeah. Like, no, you did that. Yeah. Like, you hit I him. I mean, 25 years is, uh, I mean, I guess it's, if it's armed robery, then. Okay, yes. clearly it's this a, person should have yep. stayed incarcerated. Yep. So it says, a criminal justice advocate face, is facing murder charges after cops found a dismembered body inside a Bronx apartment with the accused killer caught on surveillance video disguised in a blonde wig at the scene of the crime. So he literally like wheels in supplies mm -hmm. and leaves in a blonde wig to try and look like a different person walking in and out of the apartment. Because black men, black men frequently have long blonde hair. I, I guess right. he, he, right. the idea yeah. is That's... like he could have gone looking for like a different colored wig perhaps, but maybe Party City didn't have one. He stopped know. by like Home Depot for all the supplies for the cleanup and then Party City after that. So you see him in multiple <laughs> outfits coming and going and the super basically heard the gunshots and went and called for a wellness check. Mm -hmm. that, of course, the, the wellness check. Yep. <laughs> Not just uh, calling the police. I wonder if Rogan... This guy just doesn't sound very intelligent to me. I wonder if Rogan keeps the episode up. I mean, he's got to pull it, right? No. I no, he's going to make so much money off of this. <laughs> like, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe, so maybe the problem here isn't systemic racism. Basically, they're saying that this uh, that they might have hit this gentleman and the gentleman that he uh, it, that he is accused of killing had problems when they were serving prison sentences together in Sing, in Sing Sing. So that is bonkers, and not long after being on Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, as he was let out of a police station, he yelled, "I'm innocent." Great. Which is just not not likely. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, so no. he's the guy with the wig on for yes. sure. You're looking at it right now. I mean, I feel like even if he just shot the guy, it would be less mm -hmm. shocking. But the way that he did it was so brutal. Right? <laughs> Very much premeditated. Yeah. yeah. Or I, I don't know if that would indicate cleaning up the body doesn't indicate that you intended to go kill him in the first place. Oh, yeah. Because if you got the cleaning supplies after the fact, right. that would actually be the opposite of premeditation. Right? right? I if guess. it was premeditation, you'd have brought the cleaning supplies with you. Exactly. Um, but, you know, Joe Rogan's like, like, we're going to make a lot of money on this one. But, you know, is it in good taste to do that? I've already got a lot of money. Maybe I should pull this episode down. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, at the same time, though, like, I, I, in my line of work, I very much like it when people leave stuff like this up because it makes it easy for me to go back and be like, were there signs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, I, I, I think when this kind of stuff happens... I mean, maybe turn the monetization off, but don't take oh, it down. It would be like if Charles Manson did an interview in the 80s and someone deleted it because exactly. they were afraid. Yeah. No, you want that interview forever, yeah. forever. For historical purposes, yeah. if anything. Like. Yep. Also, uh, what Joe Rogan does is he like lets someone explain themselves in order to shed light on their ideas that they might be bad, right? Mm -hmm. Allow him to do that, I guess, even if he's put back in prison. And you also said that, uh, that Drake Bell... Oh, another criminal story. Yes. <laughs> well, recently, Drake Bell was uh, part of a documentary called Quiet on Set, where him and other Nickelodeon child stars were talking about predators who worked at Nickelodeon. And he specifically made allegations of abuse against a dialogue coach he had when he was a minor named Brian Peck. And Brian Peck was convicted. He went to prison for 16 months and has been free since then and still working in the industry. And now TMZ is outside of this guy's house waiting for pictures of him. They took paparazzi photos of him spotted for the first time since the documentary promo came out. It's kind of weird to see him in this context. Um, 
his shirt is definitely interesting <laughs> yeah he's in the pouring rain in la which is also weird holding his keys in his mouth running to the door that um, shirt is awesome if that if that was a t-shirt not a button-up I'd, I'd almost <laughs> want it but it's uh it's a button-up unfortunately right we were joking like at least you know his prison sentence didn't didn't get rid of his charm <laughs> his bad personal person. style bad, bad person very bad guy yeah, imagine you're working for TMZ and your job is to just camp outside of this guy's house, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those but, uh, TMZ journalists are something else. No, they're they're you're they're stalkers. They, yeah. they have to be stalkers, and in a lot of ways, they uh, they get the they get the job kind of like we talk about how uh, defense attorneys get to just tear people to shreds. Mm -hmm. Well, TMZ journalists get to just get up all up, all up in people's business and bother them. Yeah, it's in their job description. Mary would love it. I, I would, yes. I'm very nosy. I do like the idea of just a TMZ journalist in like an urban ghillie, just <laughs> laying there with the camera, just waiting <laughs> for days. It's like in a tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's like smudged between two dumpsters in a fake <laughs> trash bag. Yeah. He's got a, the ghillie That's dedication. turns him into like the yeah. side of a, of a dumpster. That's real <laughs> journalism. This, so this guy's been abused, or <laughs> abused, accused accused so he's technically because I, I man public opinion he was prosecuted so he wasn't just accused he's he was prosecuted yeah. before yes. for the same thing that yeah Drake's so at the time about? the minor was unnamed but because it was Drake? the uh yeah drake bell like they're they're basically thinking after this documentary comes out we're going to know that that unnamed anonymous victim was actually drake bell okay mm -hmm. or there could be others certainly would explain some of drake bell's behavior Really? Yeah, well, instantly, of course, what everyone brought up is, hey, doesn't this guy have his own allegations to answer for? And yeah. yeah, that's true. But it makes sense. I mean, people who abuse were very often abused mm -hmm. as kids. So like, yeah, I, yeah, I saw that response as well. We also have a follow up on the whole J.K. Rowling story yesterday. So yeah. do you want to explain what was going on with this as well? Yeah. So <laughs> J.K. Rowling had the cops called on her yes. by a British TV host who identifies as trans male to female named India Willoughby. The cops were called on a hate crime because J.K. Rowling misgendered this person on Twitter to her 14 million followers. And in response, this journalist named Kaylin Robertson, who used to work for Rebel Media, he uh, interviewed India Willoughby about this situation in a very disingenuous way, kind of throwing J.K. Rowling under mm -hmm. the bus. And really, the concept of free speech altogether was impugned on that interview. And they don't really have it in the U.K. anyways. They so, don't. According so. to this story that I found earlier, it doesn't seem like they have it in Oregon anymore either. No, yeah. So... Kaylin Robertson kind of had a meltdown on Twitter and ended up calling J.K. Rowling the C-word, a putrid C-word, a see you next Tuesday, and then had a mental breakdown about that and posted a Notes app apology to J.K. Rowling for doing so. I feel like Notes app should start like advertising their ability <laughs> to make apology, like, like as the apology company. It yeah. says, I'm completely sorry for my behavior toward J.K. Rowling last night, and I apologize to her for the unforgivable and inexcusable language used. It won't happen again. And J.K. Rowling actually did respond to this. Yep. She said, I accept your apology, and I'd ask any supporters of mine giving Kaylin grief to please stop now. I didn't ask for this apology. It was made spontaneously, and a good faith gesture deserves equal good faith from the other side. Uh, Peter Rossi in the chat says, thank God I'm American. Well, well, the problem with that is I found this story. I just... Why not highlight it here? It kind of fits within the context. A woman in Oregon, in Oregon has been convicted of a hate crime after misgendering a trans-identified male while asking him to leave a woman's restroom. Well, I don't think that this woman was convicted of any crime. I thought she was charged she was, or something. It says, she was charged, the, the tweet right? says convicted. So... You know, I didn't who's look the into tweet this story from? Either. Off duty bartender has been convicted of a hate of a hate motivated crime after shoving okay, so shoving and misgendering a trans okay. So it's the physical altercation that she's being prosecuted on, perhaps not just the language. But look, this happened because a biological male walked into a women's restroom. Yes. Um so I think this is the exact type of story J.K. Rowling is trying to highlight mm -hmm. in all of her posts. Oh, yeah. And yet this TV host, India Willoughby, is going to claim that this just never happens. And this that never happens. Women never had valid concerns about the trans debate. There's just zero valid concern to it. 
Um, it's all hate and extremism. Yeah. Yep. So I, I do like the, uh, they, they say that it's about misgendering. It's, it's clearly about the physical altercation. It's both yeah. at once. I mean, I guess if the woman didn't misgender in the process, that would just be assault. Yes. And not a hate crime Correct. classified as such. But yeah. Sheesh. All right. Um, all right. Uh, I, I did post this earlier. Um, do you guys know what the Bechtel test is? No, I've heard of it, though. Okay, so the Bechtel test is, uh, it was started out as a joke in the 80s, and the, the idea is that if you watch a movie or a television show, you can run this test that says, are there two women in the show that interact with each other and talk about something other than just a man? For a certain mm -hmm. minimum period of time. Yes, okay. Yeah, there's so a series of qualifications. And, and now there's, the, the, now they, we, the only reason I bring this up is because last week we did a topic where now there is a Bechtel climate test that you can do to see if you're talking about climate change enough, oh if you're advocating enough for climate change. Well, the Bechtel test, there's actually a Bechtel test section of HBO Max, and I thought that was really, really mm -hmm. funny. Like, it's like, this doesn't make me want to use your app more. It makes me want to use it less. And so I decided to Google it further. There's actually a, a site called Real Good, which will run the Bechtel test for all streaming services. Whoa. Okay, so what passes? Uh, the Lobster, 2015. Never said this is just for HBO Max, by the way. Now I don't know if this is a total culmination or if it's just some, but Devil Wear, uh, the Devil Wears Prada. Love that movie. Catwoman, <laughs> Dear White People, Still <laughs> Alice. Okay. Uh, American Honey. Haven't heard of most of Deadpool, these. Deadpool, Suicide Squad, Snowden. I, I forgot about that. The, wow. The Joseph Gordon-Levitt Snowden movie. That's now surprising. Now You See Me too. Yeah. Mother's <laughs> Day. Two women talking about something other than Edward Snowden. Interesting. In Snowden. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic Beasts, Free Fire. Uh, again, Devil Wears Prada, way ahead of its time. And if they were making more movies like that these days, more women would be coming to the theaters. So true. You know? Yes. Right? That's what they should be Speaking looking at. Speaking of Anne anyway. Hathaway and what yep. she should be doing with her career these days. Yep. So I just thought that was interesting. I look at that and I'm like, that doesn't make me want to use your streaming service. That makes me want to turn it off because it's. Do stupid. they know that normal people have never heard of the Bechdel test? Exactly. Like, <laughs> like I, I do this. Like I host a podcast about pop culture. But imagine you're just like a normal person. You get off work you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm gonna go see if there's something on HBO to watch. And you're scrolling. And I just really <laughs> want to see two women <laughs> talking about something other than a man right now to wind down for my nine to five. No, the normal person's like, what the <laughs> hell is the Bechtel test? Yeah, like, exactly. They, don't, they have no clue what that is. It's just weird. All right. I, what I'm confused about is Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers passes the test. Does hmm. it say and that? does not have a single scene where two women even are in the same like there's no no scene in the movie where two women speak to each other in the same room you must be not remembering correctly there's then. one scene where the little girl and talks to eowyn but that's it i guess that's what yeah allowed it <laughs> in the category <laughs> let's go ahead and let's move on then shall we so recently guys Zack snyder was on the joe rogan podcast and a lot of people are very angry at Zack snyder right now because they feel that he has disrespected the batman character because he's very blasé about the idea of batman's no kill rule which obviously was very very true in his movies and this is an interesting discussion so we put a poll up to you guys i said should batman kill villains Right now we are 50, right? It says, yes, he should is winning at 50%. I don't know how you can be winning at 50%. I voted no, so We're add exactly one to the no's. I wasn't able right to click now. it though. Okay, so, so you're, you're, yeah, I was you say an, no. I was a no vote. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and listen to this clip first so that we can, we can see what he's talking about here. We'll, we'll talk about it. So here's what he says. Like people are always like, well, Batman, I, Batman can't kill, right? So Batman can't kill is canon. And I'm like, okay, well, the first thing I want to do when you say that <laughs> is I want to see what happens. And they go like, well, don't put him in a situation where he has to kill someone. I'm like, well, that's just like you're protecting your God in a weird way, right? right? You're making your God irrelevant if he can't be in that situation. Did this uh, guy direct it? Yes, he did. Okay. Yeah. Batman versus Superman. Batman did can kill. He doesn't. He chooses not to. That's the point. Not and that he can't. Who is this guy? What? Well, of course he, he can kill. He can't, according to the purists who say... 
by his own rules. They, maybe they should say that he won't. Yeah, he can and he chooses not to. It's much more of a powerful thing that he can, can and won't do it than complete inability to do it. Exactly. He's able to. What's interesting about this, that's not even the part that bothers me. It's the flippant nature where he says, as soon as they tell me I can't do something, that's immediately what I want to do. That's fine if it's your movie. If you wrote it, if it's based on characters that you created, you are a caretaker of something that is bigger than you, something that was created by people decades ago. Yeah. It's not your job to say, oh, I want to see what happens. Your job is to translate it in the best way possible, you dork. Like, Well, <laughs> me personally, and I'm saying this not as a DC fan or like I, I don't know anything about the, the canon here, I would prefer to see Batman kill villains. Mm -hmm. Um, personally, like I would prefer to see that because I think real life heroes do kill villains and they're morally justified in doing so. And I think Batman's ethic of not killing villains puts more innocent people in danger. The, uh, but obviously that doesn't work so well for the way the story is structured. Well, I, I think that I think Snyder kind of made something of a point in the opposite direction when he said you're defending your God in a real way. Because think about take obviously comparing comic books to scripture is a little silly, but take Christianity. I mean, the book might have some interesting scenes if Jesus could have killed somebody, but he didn't. Like, this is God himself, and he doesn't kill anybody in the book. Sure. We somebody can't just actually, change it later. Somebody pointed you know. that out in I the I don't chat mean beforehand. all heroes yeah. kill villains um, mm -hmm. as, like, a syllogistic I wasn't saying way, that. I was, just, like, I was talking more on the canon aspect Real heroes can kill villains, and they're not morally corrupt for killing villains. Well, yeah. I would, also you, wanna, oh, uh, would you rather see Batman kill villains, like, by throwing them off of buildings, and then you just see them fall? Or, like, gruesome <laughs> up in your face, twisting the neck, bones Ew. popping out? Like, do you like gruesome killing? It's doesn't quite matter to me, um, but I'm just saying, you know, if I were if I were Batman, like, I would. Do you want to you want to make the villains suffer? No, no. I mean, that's not necessary. You know, I mean, but ending some of the villains, maybe ending the life <laughs> of the villain will save more people. And if Batman's if Batman's goal is to preserve the dignity of human life, then killing someone who's a danger to society will accomplish that. I think he's concerned about making more orphans. I'm not sure why he doesn't kill, but his parents were killed in front of him when he was a yeah. kid. So I think he doesn't, just in case those villains have kids. Dude, the Joker doesn't have kids. That we I know think of. censorship laws <laughs> made it so that Americans couldn't make vigilante justice a good thing back when Batman was first released. Here's the other, here's the other <laughs> thing. Look, anti-hero stories from the Hollywood perspective were cool about 15 to 20 years ago when it was actually unique and somewhat new. Think of the Watchmen, stuff like that. Now, dark stories are just synonymous with lazy writing because they mm -hmm. don't want to get themselves into painted into corners that they don't know how to write themselves out of because sure. they're not gifted enough to do so. Hope and justice, those concepts, as dorky as it sounds, there's a reason everyone yes. was pissed when Superman snapped Zod's neck, okay? Superman is different, though. I mean, for Batman's character, it does make more sense. And, and I also think that for Hollywood, these characters were created at a time when there was more faith in law enforcement. Right, so sure. the idea here is that the modern day <clears throat> Hollywood writer doesn't necessarily believe in the idea of the justice system and the idea mm -hmm. that you let these people go in front of a group of their peers. They would rather see this character do that because they would see the police as the problem anyways, which is just a sign of different stories being adapted at different times. We've got a $20 from Dreamcast Night. LOL, Batman is based on Joaquin Moreda, a man who got famous for killing people that murdered his brother. The pipeline is Joaquin Zorro. Batman lol and then another one from I would Crispy watch Leg. a Zorro Batman crossover film and then another one from Crispy Leg Transport LLC says they tried that before and it didn't go well for sales remember that Bane broke Batman's back and that's back uh, uh, and word. that's back and that crazy look over until he Took came over back and the word back was back. in there at least one yeah. too yeah, many it, times <laughs> it's okay. a lot of back look it's uh, it's it's about putting him in these situations and then him being heroic enough to find his way out of. Also remember, these are characters, when you watch movies, you're gonna see the character one time, theoretically before multiverses and all this stuff was a thing, you would see that villain take on that good guy one time, sure. right? In the comic books, these characters are cyclical and they come back and they're for multiple runs. Again, you guys made fun of me when I used the word rogues gallery earlier. There's a- It's just uh, a funny it term. It there, is an, there is an economic <laughs> issue to the reason why he doesn't kill when it comes to storytelling. You can reintroduce yes. the same villain and different villains interact with different heroes and bring about different parts of their characters. It's actually one of my favorite parts uh, of, of that type of storytelling. Also, his, dis like his dislike of canon is why everyone hates Hollywood. 
It is. Your ability, and I, and I mm -hmm. used Lord of the Rings. I said, you guys love Lord of the Rings. Everyone hates Rings of Power, okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to see the stories that they loved growing up adapted in a way that just says, huh, I wonder what will happen if I like change everything about it. What if he doesn't throw the ring into the molten lava? What if he like, throws it over the lava? No, that's not what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Oddly enough, Disney's kind of found a way to do it. Their whole what if thing so that you know they're subverting yes. the story. That was Marvel well, too. That, Marvel yeah. did but that's that. also, the what that's if series of comics was great. Strange worlds and yeah, that's yeah, in... If if you're gonna change the canon, make it clear that this is an alternate universe and don't do what Amazon did where they're like, we're gonna have Isildur alive 2,700 years before he was born. It's, it's one of the reasons why cop shows and, cop, and, and movies with law enforcement get away with this because mm -hmm. it's sanctioned. Okay. okay, it's saying so vengeance is, is, is allowed, right? Because the government, the state said so. Maybe that is my ultimate distrust of the system. I guess I'm responding to the broader philosophical yeah. point. I disagree with the idea that a hero becomes an anti-hero when he kills a villain. I do disagree that you immediately become an anti-hero. Okay, so if the Punisher goes into a room of mobsters, yes. kills everyone there, mm -hmm. does he know... Each and every one of those was actually a member of the mob. Maybe one of those dudes is just his dorky cousin, Mike, who just happens to be there with a group of wise guys. He hasn't thought about it beforehand. That makes him an anti-hero. Well, mm -hmm. but in that case, he's not killing the villain. He's killing a bunch of random Italian dudes from Jersey. He, he's killing <laughs> villains. He's killing no, no, members of the mob. But you just said they're not mem What if they're not all members of the yeah, mob? Okay. Then, then he has killed people who are innocent, not just the villains. You okay. know? So if he kills just the villain, that doesn't make him an anti-hero. So you're saying that it just just killing like bad guys. Like this is make why an like Walter White okay. is an anti-hero. If I mean, you could say that he became the villain, but a lot of people just see Walter White mm -hmm. as an anti-hero. I'm also more uh, more I in favor. Jesse's I like uh, yeah. I like stories where they trick the villains into into bringing about their own demise. Right, that that's almost more interesting to me. Where they catch okay. the like a dude gets caught ratting out, ratting out people, or telling on himself, mm -hmm. and then his own group takes care of him. Which still, you still brought about the end of this dude's life. Yeah. You you provide the evidence. Does that morally absolve you of what happened? Does that's it, an interesting discussion. Does it make you an anti-hero if you're willing to kill those that you perceive to be villains, mm -hmm. regardless of if they're a villain or not? Just if you think they're a villain, if the hero then was like, I'm willing to kill that villain, then oh, they become an anti-hero. Parallels here. Uh, yeah, I just I see a lot of this stuff and I, and I think it, it is interesting because most people can have these discussions and it's in it's in good faith Right. I have fun with it But I think most of it comes down to the fact that he was so disrespectful of the fact that the people who make these characters viable Meaning that there would be no Batman movies if there weren't 80 years of comic mm -hmm. book stories for people to choose from Right, meaning that a long list of people for a long time financially yeah. put in yeah. to it, make well, this character the way it is to disrespect yeah. them. It's not look, like, and I say it like this: I didn't hate most of those <clears throat> movies. I love the visual aesthetic mm -hmm. of those films. I think he's a long-winded storyteller. Um, I do on a pragmatic level. I'm like, also, there's a huge difference here between the idea of street-level villains and super villains from other planets and stuff like that. I also like the idea they say Batman doesn't need to kill him. Like the mm. the the doctor bills alone will put most of these people in like in jail for the rest of their lives because they won't be able to pay for all of the the surgeries that mm -hmm. they have to have. Yeah. Like all of the CTE from banging guys' heads into the ground is enough, right? It's interesting, but it's the disrespect to the people who made these characters as relevant as they are that matters. Is the movie out yet? No, this is like he's just he's not. It's actually he's, not for a this is pure movie. conjecture. His, movies, like... his, his time at DC is done. And uh, it's interesting. I, it's well, when it comes to superhero franchises, that it's already a charged discussion. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But. Yeah. And look, I like, and that's the funny thing. Like when we when we talk about the Nolan films, I'm like, there's no way nobody died when he's driving the tumbler all over Gotham like yeah. a madman. Right, like Batman has killed more innocent people than villains. But at that point, that seems backwards the, to the, me. The, the, the formula of storytelling that is, if they don't show a body, there's no way sure. to know yeah. for sure they died. This is also if anybody here watched the show Arrow. So in that show, when Oliver Queen, like who he's been abandoned on an island for five years, and he basically turns himself into a human weapon. Mm -hmm. Right, and he comes back and he's just killing bad guys. That's what he does. He shoots him in the heart with an arrow. Mm -hmm. By season four, uh, they, they he turned like he basically says, "I'm not going to kill anybody anymore." Right? He stops killing people uh, either in season three or season four. By the end of season four, he's taking on Damian Dark, who is a super villain, and he says, uh, "He goes, other villains, I had a choice with you. 
I don't. People will die, and he kills them. Mm -hmm. Okay? A lot of people didn't even like that. They're like, yeah, figure it out. Call Amanda Waller. There's got to be some way that you can get this taken care of without having to resort to killing because it's about the struggle that the character goes through. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's interesting, but I think for the for the sake of the matter, it's the disrespect to the lore. Yeah. Well, where are the the Snyder stands when you need them the most? No one's defending him right now. <laughs> uh, they're around somewhere. All right. <laughs> or are so that, they all bots? What, uh, they, ah, and when we needed the most, they Look, disappeared. Uh, what would you like to see first? Cute or cringe of the day? You guys decide. Uh, I'm feeling cringe personally. Cringe? Let's go with it. I want to see some cringe. I want to be white pilled at the end. <laughs> okay, we can do that. Uh, all right, what do we got here first? Uh, oh, yes, Mary sent me this one. Here we go. Let's just, it's just the first few seconds of this clip. Let's listen to this guy. Who's your dream woman? Mm. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I like how strong she is. She has a nice, wholesome look to her. I like that. And uh, she's a Scorpio, so she's probably freaking the streets. Yeah. <laughs> what? what? I didn't get to the last part. That is extremely cringy. Holy shit. Yeah, okay. he has a kink for murder. Ooh. I do want to who remembers Anita Sarkeesian? Do you remember I, Anita yeah, Sarkeesian? Yeah, I do. Gamergate. Okay. So she recently, well, last summer, she had a, a wedding-themed 40th birthday party. Even though she's, she's not, not married? married. She's, Aww. okay. That's just sad. And a rainbow bouquet. She says, I did not get married, but I did have a wedding-themed birthday party in Stockholm this summer. It was goofy and silly and fun. We had a bachelor party, rehearsal, dinner, ceremony, and reception all in one. People dressed up in the best costumes from brides, divorce lawyers, drunk uncles, and ring bear. I don't know if she meant bear or if it's actually a bear with a uh, ring. Okay, T to be fair, I think a ring bear would be sick. Kind of cool, right? I, how does she uh, have the funds to pull all this together? There are people that go into debt for their weddings, the yeah. real ones. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't know. I, there's just something really dark yeah. about yeah. having a wedding for your birthday with no actual wedding. partner. Where's like, the groom? Yeah, exactly. Like She's a sink, a single income, no kids? I guess so. <laughs> I mean, from all of that consulting work for the video game studios. Yes. I mean, she, she's probably got money. Let's be realistic. <laughs> she's making bank. Her net worth is about somewhere between 300000 and $1 million. It, You can never nice. really trust these If websites. you get... Yeah, no, you cannot. Uh, if you get the... If you get that level of fame and notoriety and you don't somehow find a way to make money off of it, then... You, that sounds like a you problem. Like... I'm, cu I'm curious now. I want to see right. what the internet says I'm worth. <laughs> let's, let's do cute of the day. We got a couple here. This one's uh, from Beer and Gear, which is a great name. Sancho, the shit-talking shih tzu, taking a well-deserved rest after Aww. barking at ghosts. Teddy bear moment. He's very cute. cute. Let's hey. do one more. All right. This one's from the Half-Baked Treehouse. It says, meet Candice Olivia de Guadalupe Marquez Flores Juarez. Wait, I thought we saw these already. Did we see these already? Yeah, these ones. I don't know if we did. Yeah, we did. Did we? All right. Well, then we got just one of the day. Guys, if you have cute of the day, go ahead and submit them. Hashtag PCC pets uh, and tag me in it. And it's always yes. the easiest way for me to find it so we can show your lovely pets here on the show. All right, Mary, let's go ahead and get started. You're going to have to explain to everybody the resurfaced mm -hmm. video of Jim Carrey with this that relaunches this Illuminati conspiracy. <laughs> well, with our guests today, I did feel it was particularly fitting to get into the conspiratorial territory. So this clip of Jim Carrey on Jimmy Kimmel has recently resurfaced mysteriously. And in this clip, he appears to be doing a bit or is he, where he's exposing the Hollywood Illuminati cult and showing their secret hand signals to the audience. Yes. So let's take a look at this and uh, we'll see what you guys think. Is he joking or is he serious or is he doing both? Are we, are sh are, should we watch the, the one from Historic Vids or should we watch the... We'll watch the edited one instead. First. Okay, we'll watch the edited one and then we'll come back. Yeah. Right, so here we go. Here's Jim Carrey. <laughs> That is so stupid. Like you don't know what it is. <laughs> you don't know what that is. I have no idea. You don't know. Jimmy Fallon doesn't know. David Letterman The Lederman creepy music. Know. You don't know. All mm -hmm. the comics and show business don't know what this is. It is the secret <laughs> symbol of the Luminati. The Luminati. mocking tongue. For years now, 
talk show hosts, people on television, people in sitcoms have been hired by the government to distract you, to make you laugh and stuff like that, make you happy and docile so you don't know what's really going on. Look at him trying to, <laughs> trying to help it out. It's hilarious. Hilarious. You know what they're trying to do? Who? They're trying to turn us into, you know, consumer drones of some sort. Well, I just got to get this. And, yeah. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I was temporarily interrupted by <laughs> six plus. <laughs> <laughs> so that was posted. Thank you. Thank you. Good timing. Okay, dance break, real quick. What I love about it is it does speak to a time where it was just a lot more innocent to talk about conspiracies than it is now. This was in 2014. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, but to to be fair, just just watching through that, um, 95% of what he said was completely accurate. <laughs> yes. Like, the, the all-mocking tongue thing wasn't, but the idea that, like, the government plants people in media, that oh, the yeah. government is trying to constantly distract us from things. It goes back to ancient Rome. They did the whole bread yep. and circus thing. It's the same exact but thing here. Jim Carrey's completely right. It's all just veiled under the all-mocking tongue joke. Not that long ago, uh, the CIA operation Mockingbird mm -hmm. to insert journalists to manipulate media coverage. Mm -hmm. Why would it be any different with inserting entertainers mm -hmm. to manipulate audiences. The CIA has a, a the CIA has a whole office dedicated to making sure that shows that talk about the CIA are portrayed in a way mm -hmm. that they like. And we were at, we, I think we still actually plan to do a video on that. There's yeah. a whole lot of material about their the notes they would give to these shows. And you can find the head of that division gets thanked on just about mm -hmm. all of those shows or those movies have him thanked in the special in the special credits mm -hmm. section of that. So and what we were talking about earlier is like one of the easiest ways to do stuff like this is to just do it out in public, yeah. do it out in, out in the open. And it's almost in a mocking way. And that uh, almost makes it unfalsifiable because yeah. you could say he's joking here, but you could also say the whole intent behind the secret Hollywood cult is to be as in your face with mm. it as possible. Kind of like the creation of the term conspiracy theorist to discredit anyone right. with a, with a right. conspiracy. Yeah. Is that if you mock it, then normal people, normies, will not feel comfortable talking about it as if it's something to discuss, like as if it's real, right? Mm -hmm. And then the community <laughs> note claims here, Jim Carrey is joking in this clip. It's been edited to remove his jokes. This is true. The full clip is three minutes and 41 seconds. I don't think we should watch that whole thing. Probably but not. a lot of the comments on that YouTube clip are claiming it was edited to insert applause and laughter where the crowd actually wasn't laughing. Uh, so someone said that they basically they knew someone who was in the crowd and it was totally silent and awkward and they edited it before airing. I will say, I someone online saying, I knew somebody who was there and they said this is like the least reliable right, source exactly, of information. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, here are the comments. My dad was there, there was no laughter there. It was added to cover it up. Thanks to Jim for putting his life in danger to say mm. this. Another Come one on. said, the crazy thing is the crowd laughing at these things he was saying was added in uh, and edited on the audio the real crowd was silent the entire time so that i i I'll, ian you might have some experience with this but um studio audiences are there not necessarily to actually laugh like if they don't laugh at the right time they will insert a laugh oh, track yeah, absolutely. right so like that it doesn't matter that it's this episode or any other episode if, if you're out in hollywood recording something live the sound people are going to be adding stuff in, taking stuff out. Even like, like WWE, like sweetens the audio and increases mm -hmm. crowd cheers and stuff during shows. It's it's all part of the entertainment. We got a twenty dollar from Better the Offender. Remember, conspiracy theories are just spoiler alerts. Uh, but there's it's it's funny because there are also yeah. these old clips of Jim Carrey talking about things like vaccines. Mm -hmm. The which, further we looked into this, the crazier Jim Carrey looked. Which I love. Yeah. Uh, so let's, here's let's Jim Carrey this. and. And actress Jenny McCarthy on Larry King in 2009 talking about vaccines given to U.S. children versus the rest of the world. They were dating at the time, so this is a, this mm -hmm. is their discussion. Back in 1989, the shot schedule was 
Ten shots given. Ten shots given. When I was a kid, what do we get? Three? It's twice as many as anywhere else in uh, in 30 countries in the Western world. But uh, we uh, give twice as many shots as any of those countries. Why is that? Well, you should educate yourself. We want to empower parents to educate themselves. Do we need to have the chickenpox? Do we need the hepatitis B shot on the second day of life? I don't think we can afford to assume that the people who are charged with our, our public health any longer ha have our best interest at heart all the time. Parents have to, t have to make their own decisions, educated decisions. When the other doctors are here, and they will be on the other side in a while after you leave. Grab them and stab them, you mean? <laughs> that was right. This is my nickname. Well, what will they me. say? Why would a doctor not want to know more about something that could save, that could save a life or prevent a disease? I don't, I don't understand. Uh, the AAP is financed by the drug companies. Uh, medical schools are financed by the drug companies. Going. This is a huge business. Vaccine, vaccines are the largest growing division of the pharmaceutical industry. Thirteen billion dollars. They control product. medical schools. I they, mean, these doctors are not learning about prevention or ask, vitamins or diets. What we're asking is for them to take a loss for the good of our children. Mm -hmm. That's a tough sell in a boardroom. Uh, this is crazy that no one remembers that this happened. Yep. And someone said this Jim Carrey is missing. He and other Hollywood actors and actresses don't talk about vaccines anymore. They also How said odd. that he, uh, he had some jokes on Saturday Night Live about trusting the science that it apparently makes him more pro-vax. He's pro-vax now. Well, which... it's he does seem sincere in this interview, especially given the fact that Jenny McCarthy yeah. was totally sincere. And I looked into and this. wrote a book. She wrote a whole book about this called Louder Than Words. A Mother's Journey in Healing Autism. This was released back in 2007. She claimed that her son Evan developed autism after getting the MMR vaccine for measles, mumps, and mm -hmm. rubella. And she made claims that she helped him recover from autism with behavioral therapy, a gluten-free diet, cod liver oil, and vitamins. And since then, she's also softened her claims and said she's actually pro-vax, but she's pro-delayed schedule. Yeah. But yeah, he's a funny man, but is he trying to joke all the time? Is everything he say says a joke? So so this is weird, because two, two days ago, I had a conversation. I made a joke at dinner where I referenced how my mom used to think that vaccines caused autism, and she looked at me funny. And I was like, you do not remember this? She's like, they do. And I, I'm sitting here, I'm like, hang on. Where are you coming from? Both of my parents are pharmaceutical researchers, by the way, like market oh. research. Oh, yeah. Pharmaceutical market research is what they do for a living. Well, what they did for a living. Um, my mom is a florist now. Uh, she decided to Love you know, be her. a stay at home mom and then yeah. do flower stuff, which Based. is just awesome for her. Based. She's killing it. <laughs> uh, but they, what, that's exactly what they were talking about. Wasn't that vaccines themselves, what's in any given vaccine is going to cause autism. They were talking about how we give kids so many vaccines and I'm not going to sit here and tell you I understand the science or even that I agree. I don't I, I don't understand how vaccines would cause autism. Um, and from what I've seen, the overwhelming consensus is no, they don't. But I will say, looking at this, what he says there is not vaccines bad. It's not vaccines are, are not good for you. It's why are we giving kids so many vaccines? Double the number that European countries are yeah. who, by the way, have lower rates of I don't know about autism, but gluten intolerance, lower rates of certain other diseases. Like there's clearly something weird going on with our pharmaceutical industry. And it sounds to me like what they're talking about isn't so much that vaccines are bad for you, but our pharmaceutical industry, because it is for profit as compared to European ones, is just pumping kids full of as many vaccines as parents will pay for, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a perfectly valid point to be making. I don't think that's conspiratorial at all. The issue, though, is I like I think there's 14 on the schedule now. I think mm -hmm. there was four on the schedule when I was a kid. I got four, I think. But they'll they'll test them and they'll say like, well, vaccine A works, B works, C works, D works, E works. They all work and they all seem to not do much bad things to the people. So then, but what they don't understand is how does vaccine A interact with mm -hmm. that vaccine E and B? And then when you throw in a little bit of vaccine L, and then then you see this new effect happen. And the people are where we're seeing the effects happen. Like, I don't know if they'd necessarily test that cool. stuff um, if they're able oh, to. But um, anyway, that's all. But that's the thing. To make blanket claims that vaccines are good or vaccines are bad is very ignorant. Some vaccines work. Some don't. You, you test them and you find out. And that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. 
Um, yeah, we've got a $20 from Nomification. I remember this guy. I like him. I think they mean you. Uh, here's for Zach. I like Brat and Ian, too. <laughs> Mary is okay, kind of like her. This is a great lineup, I think. <laughs> Here, here, Oz, I don't know how to say that, from Sweden, your new NATO member, that sort of, what, I don't know what that is, uh, for us, I mean. Okay, then, thank you. Okay. That, was, that was chaotic. That thank was you. the most non-committal compliment I've ever seen, and I love it. great, I guess. That was wonderful. <laughs> uh, also, the other thing about clips this old is it shows you the shift in power mm -hmm. in these industries where in 2009 what they're basically advocating for is our parents you know right to be informed and make informed decisions for their children mm -hmm. which is not something that most of the people in this space would say now because they would be ostracized for saying this stuff well jim carrey's tds syndrome like definitely had him veer off in the other direction where you wouldn't see him making comments. We like should this watch anymore. the other, we should watch the Norm Macdonald clip anyways. Just this okay, it this is more esoteric and difficult to understand than the other clips, but let's, let's watch it. Let's it's, go it's ahead amazing. and watch it anyway. Guys, you're gonna love this. Do you know about uh, about uh, um, alchemical uh, sexual alchemy? Do you know that the story of Jesus, how it's been altered in certain ways? I mean, yes, there was a guy. Yes, there was teachings, all that stuff. The the parallel between that and alchemical sex is that uh, there's 33 vertebrates in your spine. There's 33 years in the life of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Okay. There is a a substance or liquid or a, a, you know, a substance that comes from your medulla, which is basically completely looks like the uh, Ark of the Covenant, has has uh, angel's wings around it, the whole thing. So this this substance comes from your medulla, makes the tr trip down your spine to your sacrum, which is the which is quick get addiction. To Christ coming down into human form, yeah. and if you don't squander that essence, that sexual essence it ascends again and goes back up to heaven, which is your thing. It's also the story of Santa Claus. Why he comes down the chimney is because this, this oh. juice or this whatever substance actually passes what's called the claustrum, which is where they got Santa Claus. Uh -huh. Hey guys. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Is it really? <laughs> I don't know about any of the other stuff he said, <laughs> but I can, tell, I can tell you for certain that either this is really good satire or, and it's on Norm Macdonald's yes. show, so I wouldn't be surprised, or just complete nuttiness because Santa Claus has that absolutely not nothing to do with that. Santa Claus comes from. I can tell you precisely <laughs> where we got Santa Claus and when he started coming down chimneys, it was not anything like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, but Ooh, interesting boy. take, Jim Carrey. Uh, do we think he's crazy? He had like... Um, I don't know if you call it a psychological break in 2009 or so. He had a real, real mental transformation um, where he just dipped off the map, stopped making movies, started growing a beard, talking about that. God. He's like, I am not me. I am more than this. Probably did a bunch of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And he's a different yeah. man after the that. The vaccine clip reminds me of Tom Cruise when he was talking about SSRIs. Um, and he got a lot of hate for that. <laughs> yeah, Jenny. When, it's funny, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> when Jenny had the autistic child, uh, Jim, were they married at that point? I don't think they no, were. they were just dating. But Jim, Jim got turned on by the conversation after that, like big into the autism conversation yeah. because uh -huh. of Jenny. Interesting. Yeah, I, I will say there was some stuff he says in there that did sound a little bit like some of the really esoteric Freemason stuff. The in 33 that, levels. The 33 yeah. levels and what you just said about he sees himself as God. Like those are some things I've heard I've heard very similar statements from 32nd and 33rd degree Masons that I know, um, which is has made me think a lot recently about what they're getting up to in the higher degrees. So over the audience that side knows you are. A oh yeah, I'm Mason. I'm a I'm a fourth degree Mark Master Mason in the York Rite. Um, so I'm not Scottish Rite. It's a little a little on the esoteric Gnostic side for me. I'm more into the the history and and Christianity side. That's over on my side of things. So. <laughs> I've heard that the Santa coming down the chimney comes from like the, um, uh, what would you call it? Like the uh, Siberian yurts and stuff. They would have these like shaman would go off in around December and they'd climb out of their, their yurts, but they, the snow would be so heavy that mm -hmm. they'd have to climb up out the chimneys of these things because they'd be buried in snow. Then they'd go out and they'd go to these pine trees. They'd say reindeer eating and shitting on the ground and then 
fertilizing these Amanita muscaria mushrooms, these red and white mushrooms. Mm -hmm. You've seen those the from Super Mario Brothers, the one that eat mm -hmm. and they make them big. So they harvest these red and white mushrooms, these Amanita muscaria. They go back to the yurts. They climb down the chimney with their bag of mushrooms and then they they have to dry them out over the uh, fireplace overnight because if you eat them, they're essentially toxic. So they hang the the mushrooms in these socks over the fireplace overnight. And then when they wake up in the morning, they make tea out of it. They all trip balls. <laughs> and that's the idea of where Santa Claus, this this myth of this guy coming down the chimney with a bag of, of goods. Treats. Comes from these Siberians. <laughs> yeah, you can look up images okay. of these Siberian shaman. They, they wear red with the white. It's like a big part of their culture is the red and white Santa Claus color. All that stuff comes from that mushroom. Do you think okay. a big part of the whole discussion about the Illuminati, though, is more just because nowadays it's just far more taboo to actually... Um, look into the like to want to talk about this stuff because people are going to immediately label you as political as well. Whereas back in the day, you could kind of innocently talk about conspiracy theories, even when you were talking about government conspiracy theories, you weren't really seen as political. Does that make sense? Like you, it wasn't it wasn't politicized in the nature of like one party versus the other. Well, you were just anti-government or anti-authoritarian, or you just thought that they were hiding a lot of stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. now you're immediately dragged into partisan politics, which is super boring well yeah i guess now people on the left are just seen as those who accept expert consensus no matter what on yeah. every issue but where did that taboo originate if not from framing conspiracies as a laughing stock which is what you see in that clip of jim carrey yeah right yeah. so he was he would be contributing to that dialogue i think it's also worth considering that uh, the internet is a lot more connected now than it was in 2009. I mean, you've got, you can hop on TikTok and- <laughs> Or even 20. I have, I have a career because people hop on TikTok and just say the wildest stuff imaginable. And it just reaches millions of people who have no frame of reference to understand why they're wrong. Like to understand where this, it, look at, and this is what I meant earlier in the show when I said that uh, conspiracies in the eight, conspiracy theorists in the eighties were right. Conspiracy theorists now are, insane uh and what, what i mean by that is like flat earth tartaria yeah. like those things where it's absolute nonsense and it just gets spewed out there and people see it and they believe it because there's just so much more access yeah. so i think access is definitely also you had a part to, of you the had to situation. really want to look into it deeply yeah. back then which allowed you to actually mm -hmm. find more information and think about it more critically yeah i, I think like, you're seeing a lot more conspiracy theories now because it's so easy to be a conspiracy theorist and talking about something that you don't know anything about is a lot less dangerous than talking about something you know everything about mm -hmm. like talking about the illuminati in the 80s when no one really had any idea what that even meant mm -hmm. is different than talking about the illuminati now when you actually know what the history of the Illuminati or like I mean I don't know this is a, from the Teutonic Knights or something from the, the Middle Ages what are those those knights that would run money across Europe the uh, they were like basically an arm of the Catholic Church uh, the Templars the, yeah the Templars yeah, I think is that where the Illuminati uh, began uh, as the Templars so the the quick version of where how the Illuminati come to be is that there's a guy by the name of Adam von Adam Weishaupt it might be von Weishaupt but he was a philosophy professor. Um, well, he was technically a lecturer. But he wanted to, back in the 1700s, late 1700s, he wanted to overthrow church and state. He was an early, early anarchist. I mean, the, the kind of very similar beliefs, actually, to what went on in France two decades later. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Very quick, there's a $20 one right there. Go for oh, it. Uh, from Matt Johnson, only listening and a few minutes behind. Uh, this isn't... Can you pull it up for me? Oh, Ring Bearer uh, is a reference bearer. to How I Met Your Mother when Barney and Robin are planning their wedding. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Great show. Mind. Continue. But yeah, so the basic version is this guy, Adam Weishaupt. He wants to overthrow the church, overthrow the state, create a whole new system in Europe. And in order to do this, he realizes, oh, well, I obviously can't run for office because I live in Bavaria. Uh, I can't get into the clergy because that's years and years and years and I'll never, ever have power. Who does have some degree of power in this region? And he looks around and what he sees is Freemasonry. So he starts his own Masonic Lodge. He goes and becomes a master Mason uh, and then comes back and starts his own lodge. And then he finds a way to start a few other lodges around him. And all of them are run by his group of people. Every single lodge is led by one of his students. Okay. He, he basically, <laughs> this is literally a professor gathering together his students to make okay. a little cult. Um, it's just Dead Poet Society. It's kind of like if Dead Poet Society went really off the rails. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he gathers together his little clique of students and some of them are into it. Some of them kind of like go, I'm gonna go take classes from the other guy. Uh, 
And somehow, through a very weird series of events that we've covered in one of our videos on, on the Lore Lodge called... Uh, if you look up Lore Lodge Illuminati, it'll come up. But the, that's the long version. Um, they managed to become a Grand Lodge. Which means that they're in charge of all of their lodges within their jurisdiction. But most of Bavaria. And then they come up with all of these new higher degrees, which is when you meet somebody and they're a 33rd degree Mason or a Knights Templar Mason. Um, those are higher degrees in Freemasonry. So they invent all of this stuff. But the thing is, they only invent the first three. They never actually do the next three higher than that. So people are asking, you know, how, I get to, how do I get to the higher degrees? How do I advance? How do I learn more of the secret knowledge you guys have? And they keep being like, oh, well, you got to do this and, and that. And eventually uh, they bring on this guy named... Uh, Adolf uh, Kaniga, um, and he designs some of the stuff, uh, but then he wants a position with more authority, and Adam Weishaupt, being a cult leader, doesn't want to give it to him. So eventually this rift causes some issues, and due to the amount of division that was going on, the Bavarian government got wind of this secret society that was quite literally plotting to overthrow it and banned all secret societies in Bavaria. The Catholic Church banned secret societies within the church. And as far as anybody knew at the time, the Illuminati were completely suppressed, destroyed. They were gone. Uh, what's interesting is we have these letters from George Washington in the late 1700s, like 1790s, uh, between him and I think it was a reverend who was writing, asking some questions about Freemasonry and the Illuminati. And he talks about the English lodges. Uh, and that when he says English lodges, he means Masonic lodges. He was a, a master mason himself. And how there is concern that the French ideology and that this Illuminati will make its way over to the English lodges from, from the part of the Reverend. And Washington says, I'm not concerned that it has infiltrated our lodges, but and, and I don't think it will, but I am aware of the issue. So what you have here is a master mason and a former president of the United States in the late 1700s talking about a European secret society that has tried to infiltrate Freemasonry a full 10 years after the Illuminati were supposedly destroyed. And it seems that he's arguing it's coming from France. And interestingly enough, Thomas Jefferson... Yeah, he dabbled. We think he was an entered apprentice Freemason. He goes over to France and comes back with some very non-Masonic ideas. So what, what has been suggested, what's been proposed, is that the Illuminati leadership survived the suppression of the organization and then moved to France, where it managed to more subtly overtake Freemasonry, not by starting a whole new brand of it, but just kind of like getting in positions of power and then changing little things here and there. Because Freemasonry doesn't have a global body. It has... Uh, country-based or in the United States state-based uh, governments and those jurisdictions usually work that way once you get into the higher tiers it's a little different but point of the matter is there is a possibility that the American Revolution was a Masonic event and that the French Revolution was an Illuminati event mm. and that the two different bodies have survived to this day just the Illuminati have survived via French Freemasonry okay which is co-ed can you explain the origin of Santa Claus as well? Uh, okay, so there's St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas has a story that was probably misattributed to him later uh, about him leaving some bags of money for a man whose daughters have no... He has no money to wet his daughters off. So he St. Nick drops this bag of money. And I'm getting there, don't worry. I'll, I'll get there really quick. I'll be fast about it this yeah. time. Um, so that's the origin of this St. Nick gave gifts kind of thing. You get into Europe a thousand years later. And there is uh, all of this, this concept of, you know, St. Nicholas still, but also they start having these celebrations around uh, the Christmas holiday. Throughout much of European history, Christmas is a, a feast. You get together, you have a meal with your family, your friends, you, uh, you say a prayer, you know, that's all Christmas is for a very long time. And then during the medieval period, you start to get these big raucous celebrations where Christmas is now an adult thing, where you go out to the tavern and you have a party and you maybe rent out a big hall and you have a gala, you have a ball, something like that, depending on who you are. Lots of drinking, lots of singing, lots of merrymaking. Uh, and then eventually they start giving out gifts to the children because giving gifts between adults was a thing, but you can't just leave the kids out of it. So they start giving gifts to kids as well. And then the English ban Christmas. Bastards. What year? Uh, it was during the, uh, the Cromwell period, I think. 
uh, I think it was yeah. so, uh, this so late 1600s, I want to say. Oh, okay. They banned Christmas for a little bit, and you have this character who comes about uh, called Father Christmas. What does Father Christmas do? Well, he goes door to door bringing the spirit of Christmas and sometimes leaving gifts. And this gets mixed in with the continental European concept of Santa Claus, Santa Claus, who is Saint Nicholas and is this, you know, kind of Christmas dedicated saint. And those two characters mixed together. Saint Nicholas rides around town on a horse. And then I think in the 1800s, he gets a sleigh. Okay. And then he gets flying reindeer. Yeah. Well, I mean, does this connect back in any way to Siberian yurts, mushrooms, and I, stuff like that? I have not come across the I don't know. Siberian I yurt mushroom theory, but it would make sense <laughs> that Siberia is how he ended up with reindeer. Yeah. As okay. Christian, it, it makes sense that Christianity, as it spread to Russia, that the Santa Claus story would make it to Russia. He'd acquire reindeer and then move back. It sounds like a, a mixture of myths have, it is. have come yeah. to create what we modernly know as Santa. Because like the red and white comes from that mushroom color. The guys delivering gifts, literally St. Nicholas traveling mm -hmm. around in the city. But also them coming back at night with bags of mushroom, mm -hmm. well, mushrooms. You know, that's kind of left out of the... <laughs> but then the uh, and then the hanging them above the fireplace. Funny like how they leave the mushrooms. So, <laughs> so you, get, you lose the mushrooms and you get stockings. That's a that's yeah, you get candy instead. That's an L. I, I should make one I thing like really candy. I, I should make one thing really clear since I, I just took a look at the chat. Uh, no paganism involved whatsoever in Christmas. Um, that is okay. definitive. That is not a, a Christian versus pagan argument. Once again, we have videos on this on our channel. It was our two videos from uh, the weeks of Christmas and New Year's this past year, one on the Sodder children. Uh, I can't remember what the second one was, uh, Harry Potter. Um, and in both movies, we did a history and religion segment about Christmas. Uh, and the tree, not pagan. The Santa Claus, not pagan. The flying reindeer, not pagan. Um, the giving gifts, not pagan. There's not a single aspect of modern Christmas celebrations that can be tied back to any ancient pagan religion. And the only traditions you can come up with that are associated with Christmas that are pagan come from Wicca, which is from the 1950s. Okay. So we'll have to... Is it 20 there? And then let's get... <laughs> yeah, we'll have to call that. <laughs> so Sorry. <good>. Um, <laughs> I like gnomification. Okay, I don't want to get clipped saying this. Uh, there, is a, there is a pro or like a, a football player who has that name now. <laughs> That's because... And he's a white football player, which is, was all the rage people were talking about it a, a couple of months ago. Okay. Shane H. Wilder said, Happy Friday, Brett, Mary, and Aiden. Let's go. Also, don't forget, we spring forward on mm -hmm. Sunday. Oh, thank nice. God. We lose sleep. Yeah. Um, this is uh, this is him, by the way, if you're wondering what his name is. Is it off? Uh, no, this is uh, the football recruit from oh. West Virginia University. His name is okay. Noah. Uh, there's a the local. Name. He's a local. <laughs> yeah. You know, and also, uh, um, he's, uh, he's uh, invited to the cookout. Shane H. Wilder said, oh, and happy Friday. Ian, I missed that you were on. I do apologize, brother. Oh, and Brantley Chamberlain said, heck yeah, Aiden. I love you guys and hope for more Weird Bible. Uh, Weird Bible, the very latest episode came out last week, uh, February 28th, I want to say. And the next episode will be the last Thursday of March. Some people are saying that the, the tree might is pagan nope. or they're questioning whether or not the tree is pagan and not not a Christian, but you think so it's not. So the, the tree... gotta go watch those we, episodes. We, yeah, I, I, if you really want to get a full picture of where it comes from, I would watch those two episodes. It's literally like the first 10 minutes of What's each video. What's the channel? Uh, the Lore Lodge. It's my channel. Um, so the tree is usually tied back to one of two things. They either say it's a Yule tree or they say it's a Saturnalia tree. Neither Yule nor Saturnalia involved bringing decorated trees inside of the home, and there is not a single reference to it surviving from the period. Uh, we first start to see Christmas trees used in the late 1400s, early 1500s. I think it was actually Martin Luther, who was one of the first people to advocate for Christmas trees. Uh, the pagan connection to Yule, yes, they typically would have trees around, but that's just because Yule celebrations were typically held in the forest. Uh, there was an idea that sometimes you might erect a, a tree in, in the town square, but I couldn't find any actual references to it from mm -hmm. the time. Like, uh, And then as for the Saturnalia angle, Tertullian said, don't decorate your house with flowers while you celebrate Saturnalia, and also don't celebrate Saturnalia. Um, and then there's another story that might take place on Saturnalia, but is not about Saturnalia. That's about two characters getting married, uh, and it involved, there, there are pine trees there. That's all the story says. 
but okay. the marriage takes place outside in the woods. Let's hold. I don't talk out my ass, guys. I have a degree in this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rolando Ramirez said, "I come in and first thing I hear is Osama bin Laden." Thanks, Ian. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> let's uh, let's hold off on the rest. Let's come back after. Okay. The fact. Time to talk about AI dating apps. Yes. Oh, I- yes. Imagine, if you will, for a second, that the reality is. Artificial intelligence has totally taken over dating culture. And this is your path to finding your soulmate. You have to use an AI dating app. Apparently AI is the future of dating and we've talked about this context a few times. They're making AI girlfriend apps. There are chat bots that people are using. AI sex dolls that you can buy on the internet that are apparently able to talk with you back and forth. Um, yeah, but, but this is less invasive. After? That's the real question. This is this is a less invasive option. So this is an AI dating app called SciMatch that claims to find your perfect match using only your face. So it analyzes your facial features to determine your personality traits. Thank you. Which is uh, already controversial given the implications of uh, you know physiognomy. Phrenology. Do you want to explain physiognomy to people who might not have heard the term before? To my understanding, physiognomy is that you can tell by someone's facial features whether they're trustworthy, whether they're intelligent. Yeah. I mean, does criminal it, but doesn't traits. Hollywood already prove that to be false because they pit, like isn't the idea that people automatically seem to trust good-looking people more when that's very clearly not necessarily the fact, not necessarily fact. Like I well, don't find uh, I don't find somebody good-looking to be inherently trustworthy. That's just a small portion of good looking people that are in Hollywood, though. Um, But yeah, this is already kind of controversial because, you know, it gets into the territory of those controversial so called pseudosciences. I won't even say any opinions on that. But yeah, they claim that they can analyze your facial structure and match you with people who have compatible personalities based on that. What could possibly go They're wrong? They're just gonna match you based on your attractiveness and tell you <laughs> that it has to do with some sort of like weird right. science. It could looks match people and prevent a lot of problems. That's yes. almost definitely what it does. <laughs> Can artificial intelligence find your perfect romantic match just by examining your face? SciMatch thinks it can. The dating app runs photos of users' faces through an algorithm to determine their personality traits, such as outgoing, neurotic, the big five, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that would match yeah. extroverts yeah. with other extroverts. I don't know the details, but it's interesting to me that women are the ones who founded and run this thing. Um, cause ordinarily, you know, I just, I wouldn't mm-hmm. think that women would come up with an idea like this, but their pitch is, have you ever wondered what frustrates you most about online dating? Is it the absence of real connections, the constant swiping, the pressure to craft a flawless bio, or the disappointment of not getting matches? This is all a pitch that is aimed at men. Yes. Yeah. This is not what women are thinking about the disappointment of online dating. Our goal is to eliminate the hassle of time-consuming profiles, lengthy questionnaires, and impersonal algorithms. SciMatch is a revolutionary app that employs science to connect you with authentic, like-minded individuals, making it easier to find someone who complements your personality. So, yeah, it... it basically is a pitch that's made to a male audience, but a product that's made by women who don't relate to what their struggles are with dating online. Mm -hmm. It's kind of weird to me that they're doing that. Kind of exploitative almost. I still find (laughs) all of it is the type of thing where I I think they want to sell sell you on like the second best match, the person you almost marry but don't because it just puts you back on the dating app. Because really, if you you send someone to the perfect match, they're going to have to get off the dating app because they're not going to use it anymore. Right. Right? It's a drug dealer selling you... Uh, something that you're going to need to use over and over again. It's uh, The joke is always it's like cigarette companies selling you something that's going to actively kill you. Condom companies actively selling you something that will prevent the next generation from using their products. We've got a $20 super chat from the People's Weenus that says <laughs> what a Ian, name. what do you believe is the relationship between the historical Jesus Christ and the cosmic microwave background radiation? Oh, very little. I, I mean, be- the guy himself i mean we're all you know part of this this radiation process but uh, maybe he was tapped into like conscious like quasi consciousness or like the collective consciousness god whatever it is was but, god an 1100 watt microwave or a 900 watt microwave mm-hmm. just vibrating <laughs> just, just heating you up Brett. <laughs> there's another 20 from cobra okay. commander 
No surviving mm. records of pagan celebrations lines up with the church's habit of burning other texts and cutting down holy groves. I'm sure Aiden is right, but my inner skeptic reminds me I don't know what I don't know. Ah, yeah. So there, the Catholic Church definitely has a history of suppressing information and of burning sacred tree groves. That has happened. Uh, the thing is, we would expect there to be other documentation because the Catholic Church didn't have reach everywhere in Europe. And there's also archaeology to consider. There are the uh, the Eddas that we have that obviously were written down by Christians, but were pagan traditions. There's, I, I think, uh, here's what I would say. If one of you guys can find me a source that tells you that the pagans did these things, please present it to me. I have a show that I do Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday on my own channel. I have the Lore Lodge. You can come by. We have a Q&A section every uh, podcast episode. So... Feel free to come in, and if you want to give me a source, I'll look at it. The thing is, I spent two weeks researching this stuff for my videos over the Christmas holiday, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to find that there is not a shred of documentation suggesting the use of Yule trees, for example. So that, that's what I'm going to say. You know, obviously me saying I have a degree was tongue-in-cheek. I know a degree doesn't make you the end-all, be-all of everything. What I will say is there's a lot of people telling me I'm wrong and not a single person giving a citation. Yeah. Okay, we've got a $20 from Tacti Platy saying, I hate this. Show Ian people's Joker. Don't stop it, chat. Uh, Ian has not, in fact, seen the people's what's Joker. What's the people's Joker? Now I've got to find... Uh, no, here's the problem. Now I have to find the... the Because the original... The, we're not the original show, Yeah, we have to show video. the original one. Um, and see if I can find the original version that we that we did. Okay. Um, this I guess we we kind of swore this off for a while, but this is a <laughs> video that we use to uh, torture guests on the show. I love this. Thanks. Um, I had to see it last time. Pay to request it. They can pay somebody, to stop it. If somebody wants it. to pay to stop it, they can right now. It's going to take me a minute to find it. It's going to like that's all okay. that's coming up now is the. Is well, the I just feel like Ian deserves to yeah, see it. Yeah, don't stop it. it. I Honestly. gotta know. Ian um, wants to see the whole thing. Make it part of me. Uh, yeah. Turn me into something new. <laughs> Is it this Change one? me. No, it's not Today, this one. Today, we've I'm got... Glad. I don't... I, I, we, we're well, going to have to I'll, keep going. I'll, sorry, sorry Tacti. I've got to... I've got to... We're going to have to... We're going to have to find it. Uh, all that's coming up now, there's like in a... So what happened was is this uh, this artist, Vera Drew, did a pitch for a movie called The People's Joker that was ridiculous. But then now there's an actual trailer for it out. And the actual trailer isn't that bad, but now all I'm seeing are the results from the actual trailer, not the one that had the original. So if you can find the original, right. you can, but I don't know if I can if I can find it. Maybe it be, it's lost to the, sta it the could, sands of time. It could be gone now. I, I don't know where it is. So that's a, that's a problem. If we find it, I'll play it before the end, but I don't know where it where it is. That's, this, a, that's a problem. This says, Trans Joker movie, The People's mm -hmm. Joker being released despite Warner Brothers copyright objections. See, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's different this this would have been all i'm seeing is like our videos on it and stuff like that so sorry it's um, funny that when you look up the people's joker uh a bunch our of videos our coming. videos just yep. pop up now yep so. um okay i think i found it okay send it to me and i'll see if i can wait no i didn't nope. i didn't yeah we're getting it like uh I, I don't if you want to keep on the topic and i'll go looking for this here okay yeah. um well i think that people are going to voice some ethical considerations about an AI dating app they yeah. already have. This account called Algorithmic Justice League <laughs> said AI dating app Psymatch's approach to matchmaking uses just a selfie to determine personality traits, raising questions about privacy and ethical use of AI in dating. Can such technology genuinely understand the complexities of human connection, personalities, and desire? Now, obviously, the people who are going to be selling AI to you in the form of a product are going to answer that question with a resounding yes. Yes, it's capable of understanding all of these complexities. I think that just our human instinct will tell us that's not possible, right? Not mm -hmm. pheromones. I don't think know how it can, like a lot of attractiveness yeah. comes yeah. from smell. Like, I think even the premise of a reality show like Love is Blind, where you're matchmaking people from behind a screen, like, they're literally separated by a wall, and mm -hmm. all they can do is talk to each other, and that's how you find out if you're compatible. That makes no sense yeah. for yeah. how relationships are formed. Also, like, birth control screws with your perception of who you're attracted to. Like Finally, someone other than me brings it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I mean, but if something like, yeah. if something like that can change how you like how you're attracted to people i 
come on, you cannot tell me that this is going to work. Maybe like, it can use AI to detect which women are on hormonal birth control. <laughs> oh, wow. And then you can get a preference for the ones who aren't. Her likes and follows say that she's into these things. Therefore, she's probably more on the trad wife side. Like, yeah. <laughs> Also, Brett sent me this survey uh, that was run by Glamour magazine where they asked their readers about sexual consent from sexual assault to deep faking. And the result was that women who responded to the survey said they're more afraid of being deep faked into pornography mm -hmm. than actual revenge porn of them spreading on the Internet. I feel like that's actually that makes sense now yeah. because for for revenge porn to happen, you have to actually record the porn in the first place, which means there has to be a bad decision made in there. Now something awful can happen to you without you doing anything at all. With the exception of uh, celeb jihad hacking into the yeah. iCloud accounts of people like Jennifer Lawrence and then leaking their nudes from but their camera then, roll, but you still did the photo, you still took yeah, the photo. At least you still feel like you had some level of control over that situation at least in the beginning. I mean, yeah. but I, I think this makes sense. It says 43% uh, or sorry, um, about deep faking, 40% say they feel worried about image based SA or revenge mm -hmm. porn. And this concern was highest. Uh, wait, am I? Saranko Productions says mm -hmm. the video is made private. So the People's Joker is hereby Whoa. Disbanded, okay. ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be out there somewhere. Wait, so Vera Drew privated the People's Joker... The original trailer. Original trailer yeah. after the real one came out? Yeah. Well, maybe we should just use the trailer then. I mean, but it's not nearly as bad. <laughs> I yeah. know it's not nearly as bad, but okay. it would still be honoring I, the request. There's a thousand people in chat. Somebody can go check the Wayback Machine for it. Yep. It's definitely out there somewhere. Right? I mean, it's on our own show, so, <laughs> but we can't go back to that. We missed a $20 from Nomification. Does Zach know the story of Lucia, or as we call her in modern times, Nikki Haley? Can I add this to the pot of keeping Joker going, by the way? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just play it here. Ian, you can watch this. Here we go. Gotham City is nothing but neon biker gangs, leather yep. freaks, and cross-dressers. Is that what you want? Come home! No, I won't, Mom. I'm gonna be a comedian! <laughs> When I look back on my life, before going jokeman to harlequin, so to speak, I wasn't even sure I existed. It's like blurry, cracked mosaic of all these gender revelations. I mean, she's a he? Um, I'm trans. Oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. I was fairly certain I was in love, and I was so afraid of that feeling going away. Ah, but you should be afraid. I just want my happy little boy back. I just don't feel like a boy. You're not. Boy, I've developed an experimental treatment. You'll be mama's happy little boy. Also comes in rainbow for pride. It was foretold that someday a clown would rise. Sounds pretentious. It is. Whatever you say, Mr. J. Hunka hunka. Now you must journey inside yourself. I'm not a hero. So who are you? I'm a woman of my word. <laughs> I thought clowns were supposed to be funny. Trans Joker movie. Definitely not as cringe as the original no. People's Joker. Would you agree, Aiden? I'm horrified You're by horrified, everything yes, I've just seen. It, <laughs> it's still better than the original. I can't say for sure. I think my mind is blocking out the original. Okay, you, you put that straight in the vault. Yeah, this feels like... It, it, you guys ever see Kung Fury? No. Only parts of it. For anybody in chat who's seen Kung Fury, I got major Kung Fury vibes and not in a good way. That movie is phenomenal, but I, I'm scared of that. Mm, yeah, I mean, I'm interested enough that I would go and see it, though. I am, uh, I am here by retiring the People's Joker segment because this one is just not on the same level as the other one. Yeah, it's not as cringe, unfortunately. Yeah. We it should personally been reach out and ask for the... I feel like it was equally cringe, just way higher production quality. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. You know? Yeah. Maybe it's exposure therapy. Like, we've seen it so many times. It's like it, nothing yeah. to From us. This first time I've seen anything about it, it was confusing and chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, didn't seem horrible. I was not 
remotely interested in going to see it. I didn't understand what was going on. It was like um, a trans. <laughs> well, I have Stockholm woman. syndrome now with this movie. You've seen so. it so many times. Right, I think I, that's I the issue. Oh, the now you want to see? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, well, it's uh, you guys I mean, can go see it, Ian, and I will go watch literally anything else. Yeah, I'll go. That's work, okay. I'll go yeah. <laughs> Algorithmically, though, now I mean, more people are meeting their spouses online than ever before, right? Like this is becoming more and more common. It's just so much different when you met your like husband or wife on eHarmony mm -hmm. in like yeah. 2010 than the endless doom scroll that is yeah. Tinder and then the upselling charges on getting the, the super swipe or whatever the hell they're selling Which, you on like, there. Statistically, as a man, you have no shot without. Well, also, like, you kind of have no shot with it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really a huge scam. And then adding AI into the mix just makes it an even more egregious scam. Yeah. It just seems like an MLM. And the way that they're MLM. pitching it, the way they're marketing it, it's clearly not for other women. This is women seeing a vulnerable population of perpetually single dudes who are willing to buy into their scam for... Uh, dubious claims that they have the ability to match people when there are no results. They're saying there's 87%, they're getting reported 87% success rate, accuracy rate, with the 77% response rate of sign matches users also higher than that of Tinder. I don't know what that means. I would means. love to know what the sample size is. Yeah, and who the sample and size who is. they are. We got a $100 super chat from Trudy Jones says, this has got to be the worst news I've ever heard. How am I supposed to torture people <laughs> in the chat now guess oh. in the chat now according to puck wudgie fitness just show them one of my videos so uh <laughs> so yes trudy jones would always be willing to pay the hundred dollars to force the guests to watch the trailer it will be remembered it, yes rip i yeah i, I, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of like that idea though like uh, before tacti, they walk in tacti we showed one we're not going to show both of them in the same day sorry sorry uh the the chat hates Hate to disappoint today. yep yeah, um, uh, right. yeah. To Pat the Plumber says we're not watching both, so beat it, jerks. Yeah, we're, I'm not gonna make you yeah. guys watch both. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I don't feel like the the, 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 the young people, like the Gen Z and Gen Alpha, are they meeting people on dating apps? Because we've talked before about how they're not right about how they don't use them. They're as much. using them way less than millennials. Yeah. yeah. Is that because the novelty was new for millennials and Gen Xers? They're like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Let me see yes. how this works. I still, as you guys know, I watch a lot of old television, right? I like a lot of stuff from the 90s and early 2000s. And it's really funny to see how they would talk about online dating. Like it's this like new and mm -hmm. they're like, wait, well, not just someone new, but online? That's they, they crazy. Find it There's a crazy other episode about it repulsive, weird, yep. disturbing. Like there was a lot of stigma around it until Tinder came out in what, 2015? Yep. Yeah, something like that. I remember I had Before Tinder that, when I was 16. Yeah. When, that okay. was okay back then. 13 or 14 maybe? Yeah. Wait, that was allowed? Oh, Tinder had a 13 12. to 17 section too, yeah. That As you can imagine, it did really not go well. Really horrible yeah. idea. It was a terrible idea. Yeah. yeah. Ew. Especially because 17 year olds should not be dating 13 year olds. Um, yeah, that's like, just a given. It was <laughs> launched in 2012, Tinder. Yeah. And all you okay. needed was your Facebook. So you could just make a fake Facebook that has your age as 15 and you could actually be a 47-year-old man. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. And ever since Tinder came out, then other people just came up with their own spin on it. Like, Hinge is just Tinder in a suit and tie and Bumble is Tinder except for women are supposed to take the lead, which they hate doing, yeah. so it doesn't work. Um, and then this is just Tinder except it's controlled by robots that looks matchy with people, I guess. Which like Tinder already has enough of a problem with fake accounts that I can only imagine what AI is gonna, like that's probably where they're going with this is like, mm -hmm. most of your matches will probably not be real people. Well, that's actually part of the selling point is that you can meet and date your celebrity crush. Yeah, I, I feel like the whole dating app side of it is really, a, it seems like it's, it's kind front. of a cover. for. There's a $20 super chat here from Not That John Stewart says, shut up, Trudy, and sarcasm. <laughs> um, we showed the trailer. We just showed the second one. The one they found is actually the clipped version from us watching it the first time. Ooh. And I'm not watching myself on screen again. I'm just not doing I that. I would like to see it, though. I'm not doing that. <laughs> no. doing that. All right. Let's go to Super Chats. Okay. Uh, Tony said, anime was cheap in the 80s. Mex bought a bunch of TV rights and put it on public TV. A bunch of kids grew up with Dragon Ball. Some became cartel members. Well, you know. So if you think about it. If you possible. think about it, Dragon Ball Z caused the current problem in Mexico. Oh, okay. D 
DCNC said regarding U.S. best exporter of irony, I've seen the street interviews, half you lot can't spell irony. That's the supreme irony. Okay, you win. Okay. <laughs> you lot <laughs> sent in pounds. James Ornthal Wen said Tetris was a low key middle finger to communism and very timely for the present day domestic and global sociopolitical conflict. 10 out of 10, highly recommend. We'll have to check that out. Okay. I didn't know that a movie about Tetris could be so captivating. Yeah. T-Dog said if Anne Hathaway gets naked for the movie, people will go watch it. Also, isn't Heidi Klum married to a man 16 years younger than her? Very lucky man. They're referring to a new movie Anne Hathaway is starring in where she plays a single mom in her 40s mm -hmm. who starts dating a, basically a stand-in for Harry Styles who's 16 years younger than her. Oh, boy. Um, after taking her daughter to one of their concerts. Oh boy. So, um, yeah, I'm not doubting that, like, this has an audience. I just think it's really cringy. I saw uh, a movie relatively recently. I think I think my girlfriend was watching it, where uh, it was Jennifer Lawrence dating, like... A no night, Hard Feelings. It, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's this woman in her 30s who is enlisted by the kid's parents mm -hmm. to date this... I mean, he's not a kid. He's 19. Yeah. But all of the promotional material is very on the nose about the age difference and, like... I will admit, it was... It was not a bad film. I, I wouldn't like rewatch it, but I was like, ah, this isn't horrible. It was a little weird conceptually. I'm just glad that they were of age. One that's, right. yeah, I, I do think there's a weird amount of like, when it's girls, it's fine. No, this is what I'm saying. I feel yeah. like there's a specific push right now on age gaps where mm -hmm. the woman is older, but Brett disagrees with me. No, I, what? You, oh. you said you think that this isn't really a recent thing. It's always kind of been like this for many decades. I mean, I, I think, that's, I, I think yeah. it's existed. I don't know about the idea of concerted push, maybe in films, but in television shows, they've done stories like this. Stifler's mom was yeah. a thing back the graduate in the back 2000. in like, what, the 60s? Yeah, this is not, this is not new. Yeah. Uh, I will, go, interestingly, yeah. though, the, the movies that do the age gap where it's an older woman, younger man, yeah. often kind of skate by with no backlash meanwhile a tv show that was based on a series of books called the time traveler's wife that made it one season i actually have seen it the show is no worse than any of the movies or shows that have an older woman younger man it's a older man younger woman and it got canned after one season due and to that the show did well it was in the ratings it did well it was solid production controversial material but like the, there was no push to have it shut down from the audience. The audience yeah. was watching. Mm -hmm. So you see this weird, and maybe it's because there are more movies where it's the woman is older, but you know. The older woman, younger man phenomenon was like usually told from the perspective of the younger man. I think in The Graduate is from the guy's perspective. And Stifler's mom was all about the guys talking about the mom. The mom was kind of a secondary character, but now with no hard feelings, the woman is the main character dating a young guy. So it's like, probably speaking to all these women in their mid to late thirties that are single, I yep, would imagine absolutely. is what this is about. All right, let's, let's go, let's finish up. Let's talk about yes. what the hell's going on in sex. <laughs> well, it totally. seems like right. sex scenes are a divisive subject mm -hmm. with audiences. And it seems like it's also a divisive subject with the actors and actresses who are doing sex scenes in TV shows and movies. And we just saw this story that Brian Austin Green, who was a main cast member in Beverly Hills 90210, one of my favorites, was personally hurt by his ex-girlfriend's sex scenes in a TV show that they were both on. He was, uh, he was with the beautiful and amazing Tiffany Amber Thiessen. Yes, he says that her doing sex scenes with other actors specifically played a hand in their relationship falling apart. And this, I think, goes against everything these people say yep. about sex scenes, that you have to be free, uninhibited, it's totally professional, It's it doesn't have any strings attached whatsoever, it has nothing to do with their real feelings, and based on his own account, that is not true. Yeah. yeah. It's also interesting because we, t we hear a lot about today when they talk about intimacy coordinators, about just how mechanical they want to make it because they want to coordinate everything down to the, to the very last movement, right? right. Mm -hmm. Lest somebody get accused of sexual assault or something like that. No hands wandering wherever. You know, there's a, it's weird as more and more of these scenes are filmed because maybe not in movies, but in television, it seems like these networks really, really need these things to be in there 
there to bolster ratings. Mm -hmm. I don't know how. I feel like you'd want as many people in the room as possible. But if you're watching shows with your family, do you really want sex scenes to just come yeah. out of nowhere? Right? I don't uh, think anybody wants that. It would be it, weird but, if they said they did. But, it, but it, it does feel like one of these things where all of the stories talk about how... Because, like, oh, for instance, when Neil McDonough said that he won't even do scenes where he kisses another mm -hmm. woman because of his religious convictions, he gets made fun of. Yeah. Well, did he say it was his religious I think convictions he did. Yes, he did. specifically? Yes. I believe he said that it was like a religious because thing for him. There were other Catholic. There were his... other examples where it wasn't having to do with religion. It was just like you know, I'm married. I'm or I'm in a committed relationship, and that doesn't from feel him right specifically. To me. But there were other examples like Chris Evans, right? Yeah, uh, well, yeah I don't other... think it's always religion. You know, I personally for me, it's that you know, I'm not even married. I just have a girlfriend, and I wouldn't. I the most I would do on camera, like, is kiss somebody. And yeah, not for, with tongue. For some people, that's <laughs> even too far. For yeah. some of these professional actors. And when they make a statement like that, they're accused of being unprofessional about it. Yeah, which is just stupid. They want chemistry. They want to see it. They want to record two people falling in love for real. And that's like, if you're that actor and you have someone at home that you're dating or mm -hmm. married to and you're supposed to go fall in love with this person, that's like, yo, that's going to yeah. rip your relationship to shreds. And Neil has yeah. talked about how he was denied roles for a while because of that conviction because of that stance that he had because like we said he's not free enough he's not uninhibited well enough. yeah that's that's to what you said ian that's a method of acting is you have to submerge your subconscious and make it one with the subconscious of the character you're playing i don't know if i really believe in that but having no experience doing it i don't know you're supposed to really actually feel what your character feels so if you're actually attracted to your co-star, that seems like an issue for your relationship in real life. I like the idea now that like all the best actors are going to get screwed because to be really good at your job, they're going to have to be to pr pretend to be attracted to all these ugly women they're mm -hmm. hiring now. <laughs> well, for Glenn Powell and Sydney Sweeney, who just made a rom-com together, Anyone But You, the rumors were flying yes, that, that they, were really they were getting a little bit too touchy-feely and Glenn Powell's fiance, mm -hmm. who is also a super model by the way she has no reason to think like sydney sweeney is her competition mm -hmm. but she like left him. emotions are not rational though so they broke you know. up over this i allegedly. didn't know that they broke up like glenn powell and, and his fiance they broke up and it didn't break up sydney sweeney and her fiance not sure why but this uh, is a real phenomenon i mean i i have an idea of why two reasons <laughs> well easier easier for a supermodel to leave her actor fiance and go get another actor fiance than it is for Sounds like a producer Sydney to go and get another Sydney Sweeney. Is, Sydney Sweeney's fiance is just like a normal like finance bro. Yeah, I think he was a producer on the movie, if I heard correctly. Yes. But like, yes. yeah, that's what I mean. Is it's going to be a lot harder for him to go find another Sydney Sweeney than for her to go find another Glenn Powell. You mm -hmm. know. Um, let's listen to Brian Austin Green's interview on uh, the TMZ article. Okay, here we go. Tiffany came on. Poor fucking Tiff. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> We're Tiffany. far enough in. Like, I, you know, Tiffany came on. Poor fucking Tiffany came on the show. I'd never been in a real serious relationship before. Um, I was incredibly jealous every time she would fucking have to work with anybody else because we had already been doing the show for four years. I was like, this is my family. This is, you know, I used to bring Tiffany to events. So she knew everybody from that. And all of a sudden she's, you know, doing like sex scenes and shit with, pe with people that were like my family and my brothers. It was yeah, strange. Yeah, that's weird. So I remember like I was very, uh, I was really just fucking but jealous and like boisterous and like didn't, I, I, I made it really hard for Aaron. I made it really hard for Chuck Rosen. I made it really hard for people because it was like, I was trying to, without making demands, make demands of like, you know, <laughs> don't do this again to me. Like this is, you don't have to do this. Let's do, you're like really putting fucking pressure on people. Mm. And now looking back on it, I can't imagine what that was like for her. Right. I well, can't imagine what it was like for her being with me for three years at that point. And then 100%. all of a sudden being on set and having to do these scenes, but then having her fucking boyfriend who she lives with, by the way, freaking out the way that I was. Well, like, I cannot imagine. That's also just so he's, he's kind you? of blaming himself yeah. for feeling that way when I think this is a normal human reaction and celebrities have no idea what an insulated and strange culture that think, they're a part uh, of. I think he made similar demands of Megan Fox. 
Do you think he was when they were to married? Megan Fox for like ten years, so it's still unknown, right? Yeah. Like what was behind that divorce? Yeah, and three kids as well in the mix. Very sad. When did they get divorced? Uh, twenty fifteen or something like that. Weird. Or maybe that was when they got married. No, no, they got married before that. But yeah, yeah who knows? It's just so weird to be like, oh, it must have. You know, like, on the I one hand, the like, problem. I I do get how like you could compartmentalize and be like, all right, I do understand that that must not have been fun for her, that that must have sucked. But you don't have to blame yourself. It's not your fault. She didn't have to take the job. Like, you didn't have to stay on the show. Mm -hmm. You could have threatened to leave the show. But there's not a ton you can really do. It's not like necessarily your fault that you were upset. Mm -hmm. Like you're allowed I, to be upset. This is like part of a broader issue where men aren't really allowed to make demands of women that they're with anymore. Well, isn't he also kind of just taking account of like responsibility for his feelings and for, saying, like, "Look, I felt that way." Yeah. And the demands I was making of her within our community were considered unrealistic. For men outside of Hollywood, what this boils down to is like, are you going to let your GF hang out with her male friends yeah. alone? Exactly. That's the relatable part of it. Yeah. Uh, Did, obviously, no one's girlfriend is out there doing sex scenes with other actors in Hollywood. That's not normal and not relatable. But a lot of guys talk about this. Yeah. Did Brian get her the job? Or did she just yeah, get it I think herself? Yeah, he said that like, she, he was part of In the sense, he yeah. brought it on himself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like maybe he, at the very least, brought her around to like parties. Mm -hmm. But um, Also, I saw this headline from Kate Winslet saying that she wishes when she was doing sex scenes, there were intimacy coordinators at that time in the industry. Now these are common practice. You can't do sex scenes, essentially, without having an intimacy coordinator on set making sure that no one gets an HR complaint. But she said uh, she had trouble standing up for herself, so she needed someone to be in her corner. Which is obviously telling, right? The HR yeah. intimacy coordinator yeah. has to be in the corner of, of the, the woman. Because well, the HR intimacy mm -hmm. coordinator so, will always be a woman. There are that, I the male, the actor gender. is always going to be the be potential aggressor. Mm -hmm. There is no gender parity in intimacy coordinator jobs i also feel like if you're if you're in that position how how can you possibly have any sort of real chemistry on or even show chemistry on camera mm -hmm. if everything is so like manic like if you're gonna put yourself in that position as an actor it seems like the kind of thing you should only do if you're okay with the little accidents that might happen, like a hand goes somewhere it's not supposed to, or yeah, you know, like well, it's, then it's it, it boils down to whether they attribute malice to yeah, the exactly. hand going there. And depending on how much of a feminist you are, you may see malice there where there might not be any. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. it, it just seems like uh, they were a waiver an, would be appropriate. Somebody asked what an intimacy coordinator is. An intimacy coordinator's job is basically they're they're like the director, but for an HR department who is there to make sure that all parties involved of a sex scene yep. feel as comfortable as possible on set. It's uh, it's pitched as an idea where it's like, oh, they make everybody, mm -hmm. they make the job so much easier. They're good for not getting sued. You see, when an HR consultant and a porn director fall in love, they have a baby. And that baby is an intimacy when they coordinator. Have a special hug. Exactly. Yes. yes. <laughs> a special coordinated hug <laughs> exactly. that is very carefully think, scripted and logistically planned. Do you think intimacy coordinators coordinate their own intimacy? Do you oh. think they're like in they, the bed, like, oh. all right, stop. now put your hand here. Leave it Don't touch that. They have no work life balance. <laughs> they, yeah. They take the coordination into the bedroom. But she gets sure. home and she makes her husband sign a form every single I time. I, I think that here Kate Winslet is just saying the quiet part out loud, which is that. Um, most people are clearly uncomfortable with the idea or the reality of simulating sexual acts on camera for millions of people to see. That makes people uncomfortable unless they've been totally desensitized mm -hmm. to doing it, which is not a good thing, by the way. So I think the real conclusion you should come to is let's not do that. <laughs> let's not simulate sex on camera because everyone involved clearly finds mm -hmm. it uncomfortable and violating. I say just make them sign waivers and, and be like, And what happens, happens. And hire, hire a couple of porn stars and do that's, body I doubling. mean, that's what True Detective did. Like, that's, that's, what, that's what True Detective did. They just hired adult film stars. because That's what you know, Game of Thrones are they, did. Are they going to sue? Probably not. You know, the, it's, it's what they do. The, the one girl in Game of Thrones who's uh, like the redhead at the beginning of the series, she's a prostitute or whatever, like... They, there's several scenes where she's got to be like full frontal nudity, uh, like simulated sexual stuff. And they just hired a porn star who looked like put together enough to be a 
a Hollywood actor. Yes. Uh, like, and they just went, okay, you do it. Yeah. We'll, we'll find a porn star with acting chops mm -hmm. and put her in the role. And they did, and it worked. Yeah, but the viewers are still going to perceive it as you, which also presents another problem. Yeah. You know? Yep. But anyway, let's uh, read the rest of these super chats. Do it. Shane H. Wilder said, uh, please use pretentious artist voice. It's just art, man. It's about living amongst capitalistic consumerism. You just wouldn't get it. I yeah, like living in a mall, it's dude. Art, it's just, it, it really is. It's, about, it's artistic. It's about being like an arm's length away from the capitalist world that embodies it's us It's about all. being an arm's length yeah. away from Auntie Anne's uh, and lids. <laughs> and, and what I really need is a pretzel. <laughs> Listen, man, you just got to subvert capitalism by living within the system in the most literal way but possible. But not paying for it, bro. Like, you're, sort, amongst, sort of. you're amongst the lions, bro. Corey Anderson has a question for you, Ian. What is your thoughts on Ian Shaftcam in the IRL chat? I love it. You love what? it? Love everything about it. Wait, what? Yeah, that's, that's all I can say Ian about that. Shaftcam? Are you aware of this? Uh, no. This something that's often spammed in the IRL yeah. chats. Just and the various names for Ian's body parts that get yeah. uh, that get added there. Gets me up in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's your morning motivation. Keeps it coming. It gets mm -hmm. him up in the morning. You heard oh, it here first. Yeah, ladies and that's gentlemen. that's awful. But that that that. that. <laughs> Corey Anderson said, Aiden, when are you going to do an episode on Black Eyed Children? Ooh. The Yuba City 5 vid, vid was crazy. Now that is a movie to make. Uh, Black Eyed Children's a good one. I should I should find a way to work that in. Um, yeah, that's a super interesting topic and nobody's totally sure where it comes from. There's there's all this like, I think that one began in America and it was like, a, it, it resembles some Irish stuff too. And the Irish stuff is been located as probably like you know kids with autism um back in the middle ages but yeah that's definitely what i can do and thank you on the yuba city the yuba county five one that was a bear to research and uh i'm glad people are enjoying it i do think a movie for that would be phenomenal uh if there's anybody who can make it happen it's wendigoon shane h wilder said bucky ducky dm'd me to tell brett and aiden hi no idea why he left out mary and ian seems a tad bit rude i wonder <laughs> if i can get the five dollars from him no, no, you got free clout from you just now. Corey Anderson said the robot grandma story was crazy as well. What? Uh, oh, yeah. So this is another one I've covered on my channel. There's apparently the family who told the story has come forward now, but there was this story uh, back like 20 years ago where this family went camping on Mount Shasta in California uh, and one of the kids disappeared for like overnight. Uh, okay. And when they eventually found him, he was like sitting in a bush in an area very close to the camp where they had looked already. It's a missing 401 case, uh, and, but in the book, it's all anonymous. Um, so he said that overnight he had been taken by his other grandma to a cave where there were spiders and, you know, purses and weird stuff. Uh, and that like she had glowing red eyes and all that. And so they went and they actually told the grandma about it because they were like, ah, he probably just had a bad dream. Like he fell asleep and had a bad dream. Um, the actual grandmother was like, that's weird. When I was camping on that mountain with my friend, he and I like both woke up the next morning. I was outside of my tent and both of us had like two weird fang marks in our neck. So of course it's an anonymous story. What? It's, it's a very weird story. Uh, you know, <laughs> okay. I'll go look into the more recent one, but yeah, that one's wild. Uh, it could be chalked up as a kid. Um, with a very vivid imagination, it could be chalked up as him actually being kidnapped and taken somewhere and then released for some reason. Um, and of course, I suppose Robot Grandma is always a possibility. always a possibility. Okay, we got a twenty dollar from the Manic Mustache. Hey gang, late as always and apropos too cute. I was informed by my wife that y'all skipped over Candice for cute of the day. For shame, Zeus wasn't happy about it either. Wait, uh, what did we skip over? You'd have to resend it, bro. People get so mad at me when I don't do it. It's never on right. purpose, y'all. It's never on purpose. People get so... <laughs> so last week... Okay, so last week we had a, a guest. Uh, we had a, a cute of the day with somebody whose who's, who's, um, dog had since passed away. And we had two of them right in a row. And we just kind of laughed about it because it's like... The, it's supposed to be cute of the day. It ends up being kind of depressing. And I, it wasn't meant to be disrespectful to the person. But they wrote like quite a long letter um, about their dog... 
because they love their dog. And I, I, I sent him an in apology. The comments? On, in the, so yeah, he so he sent the tweet, and then under that he wrote a long letter that I just didn't have because I sent the initial tweet to myself. That's how I get all the cute uh -huh. days. And we just kind of laughed about it because we're like two dead pets in a row is not very cute. It's actually really sad. And when you're in the middle of a show, it's just kind of, we laughed it off and he was upset about that. Uh, so I sent him an apology later on Twitter. So I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. It's just, that's the way it goes on the show sometimes. So I did say sorry to him, but it wasn't meant to be anything rude. Gosh, I didn't know that happened. And there's, uh, it was, uh, you were, it was last Friday. So oh, I wasn't you, here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's what, another 20 from Chris Noski. Uh, the real question for Ian on the IRL chat is if he knows it's 99% dudes asking to see that. That is. <laughs> Are you IRL aware? Scandal. It's the IRL <laughs> chat, so it's, you know, the, the dude to, to not do This ratio. is total news to Ian. And really? he's never heard this I before. It's it's International Women's Day. It should be women's. Oh, happy Women's stuff. Day! Yeah. I'm Today? actually curious to see the the splits on like this show IRL, like what what the male to female ratio is for the audience. I would guess that we have more females in the audience than IRL, right? More, uh, not more than men, but yeah, but more than more females than IRL has watching. I Probably believe. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yoroshima Otaru said uh, Snyder has always been a hack. Uh, you know, that depends on, yes. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, no, I, I well, like, yes. <laughs> I like Watchmen. I, I like Watchmen, and he's got a couple of other things that I like, and, and I don't hate the extended cut of Batman vs. Superman. The Justice League movie was awful. Both the Joss, the Joss Whedon one was really, really bad, but his four-hour cut was fine, but I would never watch it more than once, and I do like Man mm. of Steel for the most part. But understand that the ending is not really something that an actual fan of this character Superman would like. I just think in a world where all Marvel movies are silly and stupid and every second uh, line is a joke, I can appreciate somebody using actual serious dialogue. Okay. Shane H. Wilder said, Batman has killed since his inception in the 30s. It's in an early issue, he had a villain hanged from a rope tied to a helicopter and flew it around. Yes, there is plenty of canon of Batman killing, but the point is, is oh, that Oh, and then nowadays, he said Batman killing was canon until the 50s comics code. And, and that mm, is like, it. That, what that is, is now it's the exception and not the rule, because the yeah. rule is the, they've got so much mileage out of the idea of him having a code. Mm -hmm. Okay, so was I kind of right when I said it, it sounds like censorship laws? Yeah. Nice. Hmm. Okay. Pat the Plumber said, what if 13 of the 16 mobsters were feds? Um, well, then you still are killing all villains. Yeah. So. I, I, I don't get it. Uh, there are three mobsters. HR wants you to look at the picture. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dreamcast Knight said, I think there is a Zorro Batman comic, Ask Razor Fist. I think he talked about it. Speaking of that, the shadow comes after Zorro on the pipeline to Batman. Uh, That's and, uh, incredible. They're ruining Zorro now too, from what I what? understand. Like just modern interpretations. How of Zorro. lame! Mm. Jake, I, I haven't seen the old ones in a while, but I remember being like, "These are good movies." <laughs> um, Jake Martin said, "Mary should see Dark Knight's Metal and see the Batman who laughs in action." Uh, yeah, those are that? those are Batman animated. Okay. Yeah. Shane H. Wilder said, oh, and the hanging was in Batman 1 from 1940. And he said, much as I hate to take a human life, this time it's necessary. <laughs> okay, Brett's wrong. No, Brett is not wrong. Brett L. Brett is not wrong. Not that John Stewart said, Mary, Anita has been on that grift train for a long time. She made bank. Okay. Yeah, she was, she was making a lot of money off of all of that. I mean, even to this day, I'm sure they're hiring her for stuff. DD Mega Doo Doo 97 said, Hey everyone, at home sick, mostly watching old movies. Do guys, mostly Brett, have any recommendations? Of course, after the stream. Also, glad to see Aiden and Ian. Yes, okay, so if you're looking for a show to watch, there is a show on Roku, which is the only place I've been able to find it recently. It used, yes, Roku TV. Okay, like the Roku channel? Yes, the Roku channel. Wow. Um, limited ads, only one or two per episode. It's called The Booth at the End, starring Xander Berkeley and Sarah Carter. Um, a very interesting story about a man who grants people wishes but requires them to do something they don't want to do in return. And it's a fatalist story. Fellatio. Uh, basically, right? Uh, but we're all, <laughs> no. all these stories, all of these people that come to visit 
the man in the booth. Their stories end up interconnected at the end. It's quite thought provoking and interesting. You don't like the main character, so it depends on how much you need a likable main character. He's certainly not a likable guy, but it is quite interesting. Otherwise, as I've been talking about all week, check out Third Watch, also on the Roku channel. Story about firefighters, first responders, and cops in 1999, New York City. Lots of slurs and language that you can't use today because the world is just so much more buttoned up than it used to be. Boosted Yogi said, yeah, I almost lost daughter to the MMR vaccine. Um, well, I'm glad you didn't. Glad you, didn't. I, glad you didn't. I've been listening to Candace Owens' Shot in the Dark series, and she did a whole episode dedicated to the MMR vaccine. I'm not an expert, neither is she, but it's definitely interesting to learn about the risks. Shane H. Wilder said, the chimney comes from St. Nicholas throwing bags of money down the chimney of a man, so his... I think that he was, had a dowry for his yeah. daughter to keep them from prostitution. Well, nobody throws any so, bags down any of the house's chimneys that I lived yeah. at, which is so, a problem. So that that is the version that I had heard when I went and I, I looked back to the earliest possible version. He leaves it through the window. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I heard that too. In the, in the chat, plenty of fish is Brits reaching to Roku. Yes, I'll do anything but watch Apple TV. Literally <laughs> anything. I'll even watch commercials before I'll watch Apple TV. D didn't he throw it through the window and then it ended up like near the hearth and that made it there's, them think that... In the retellings, there's other details <laughs> yeah, that get in there. But if you look back to... I think it was Eusebius. If you look okay. back to his account, uh, it, it's just money on the counter. And it probably is actually a story about... Um, God, uh, what was this? Uh, it's not going to come to me. Okay. I got to cut out a yep. little early, You're good, guys. I, no uh, problem. I had a lot of fun today. Let everyone love to find you. Yeah. Well, find me at Ian Crossland. Find me at on TimCast IRL tonight. I'm going to go get ready for the show. Yeah. It's going to be uh, exotic and exhilarating. Uh -huh. Thanks for having me, everyone. <laughs> what, what makes it exotic tonight? You'll find out tonight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Eyeballs on the screen, everyone. Fantastic. <laughs> See you later. And he said super, super chats that come after the fact, we will forward them to Ian. Thank Thanks. you. Yes. Please. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yes, Send them in. Qualms, super chats. Questions and concerns. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Ian. Okay, Charlene Ferguson said, Freemasons scare me, but so does Ian's story about how Santa was a mushroom drug addict. <laughs> Love you, Ian and all. Thank Cheers. You. <laughs> I don't know if you guys could hear that. Um, Some Freemasons are scary. Monk. There's a few of them. That you I, know them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brewmaster Monk said, Aiden, have you read Archibald Ramsey's The Nameless War or Libido Dominandi by E. Michael Jones? No, I have not, but I will try to remember those titles um, so I can take a look at them. Okay. Bookstore Thor said people's joker is why Mary wants Batman to kill. Uh, you know, See? could be. I have a good justification. Could be a justification. Serenko Production said the video was made private, Brett. Yes, yep. we unfortunately learned that. Corey Anderson said just going to have to rip the people's joker from one of the older episodes. Did they send it to you? Um, I'm not going to look for it. Right no, now. okay. Because <laughs> you don't want to look at that's yourself. Why, okay, that's why that sounded, that's why it sounded familiar. It's from uh, Augustine. Um, it's from City of God. The, the term is from City of God. Mm. Libido, libido Dominandi. Com Cobra Commander said, Bumble laid off 37% of its staff. Turns out expecting women to be equals isn't popular if it means more effort on their part. I wonder how the, men on, I wonder how the men on that platform feel about being approached. I mean, do they look down? Awkwardly, they'll take what they can get with their yeah. eyes down. They're like, oh, me. You're interested in me. Uh, Serenko Productions said, look at Twix, Brett. Um, Are you going to look at Twix? Nope. <laughs> they're asking. They're paying you to look at Twix right now. Mm -hmm. Not doing that. OK, just so we're clear, he's objecting. Shane H. Wilder said sex scenes cause issues with real life relationships. Who would have guessed? Yeah, that's not exactly surprising. Brian blaming himself for a natural reaction to the sex scenes is sad. Agree. Corey Anderson said, I saw on Instagram that uh, Catholicism isn't Christianity because the Bible says Jesus is against being Catholic. What is that about? Crazy. By the way, I did find it, but Ian's not here anymore. So there's really no reason to watch the trailer again. <laughs> oh, you found it. I found it. Okay, Go we'll find make sure him while you he sleeps that. and play it right over his head. Or I, send it to me and yes, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll I'm save gonna, it. Yes, I never bookmark anything. Um, you saw on Instagram that Jesus himself said that he is against being Catholic. That That's just impossible. Source. Also, Catholicism is uh, Trinitarian Christianity. It's only vaguely different from the orthodoxy. I, I, like, <laughs> there's no... I, don't, I can't imagine I don't what the argument what would be means. here. I don't know. Um, uh, the differences between Catholicism and the orthodoxy are minor for the most part. 
There's a, there's a few that cause like the schism, but well, the word Catholic isn't in the Bible. No, so, so it means universal. Uh, yeah. I'd... So okay, I, I, I just can't. I can't figure out what that could possibly. I don't know mean. what that means. Nate said Ian is one of my favorite people on the internet. Well, I agree, but Ian yeah. is one of my favorite people in general because he was just in the room with us. Exactly. We were graced by his presence. <laughs> Not that John Stewart said I liked Sucker Punch. Yeah, like that's a divisive one as well uh, from Snyder. So depends on your taste. The manic mustache said, "Not mad, but the wife gave the marching orders." Wait, huh? what? In What's relation that? to what? In relation to. Um, the pets, the cute of the day. His his wife was very disappointed that we skipped over. Oh, perhaps their pets. Definitely not intentional, sir. Shane H. Wilder said, have a wonderful weekend. I'll be dropping for a short about Mary's bar fight tomorrow morning. It will be a classic. Nice I look. hope y'all will enjoy it. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. We will. Great. We're almost <laughs> at a sixth crisis party, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. The last of my kind said, Damien Wayne said, Batman doesn't kill the <laughs> TB. The traumatic brain injury does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, also, like, you know, the ben the the medical bills bankrupt you. Mm -hmm. Thomas Wayne is more than happy to kill people. That's that's definitely true. So in in the alter in the Elseworlds story. So you know, it is what it is. All right, guys. Before we go, would you hit the like button on this video and subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already? Unless we get to six crisis parties before the day is over. Aiden, my friend, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Let everyone know where they can find you. Uh, well, if you aren't completely bored by my long diatribes about how things happened, then you can find me over at the Lore Lodge. Uh, that is where I do all of my content. It's primarily true crime associated, missing persons and, uh, and other unsolved mysteries and the like. We have a video coming out on the Native American legends about Bigfoot. Uh, an hour and a half ago. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what we do over there. You can find me at the Lore Lodge or you can find me at Aiden Mattis or the Aiden Mattis, basically anywhere. If you look up my name, it comes up now, which is cool. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mary. You can send me validation on Instagram at Mary Archived or you can send me hate on X that is also Mary Archived. Do we just hang out till we get the Sixth Crisis party? I think so. Yes. It also party. gives me time to mention that I have my streaming channel, which is at the Aiden Mattis here on YouTube. Uh, what have you been streaming lately? Uh, Tuesdays, we've been recording a pop punk album uh, in my friend's basement. Thursdays are typically okay. a reaction stream where we'll look at conspiracies like Tartaria or whatnot. Uh, or if somebody sends me a video to review or somebody has wants to challenge me on what I said about Christmas, for example. Uh, and then Fridays, we play Helldivers. Okay, so if they want to fight you, they should tune in. On Thursday is the Thursdays. day to fight me. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are some contenders in the chat. Oh, I'm sure. There always are. Uh, and we're just, somebody said, uh, Brett, uh, did y'all mention Akira Toriyama passing? If not, you fail as a pop culture podcast. Yes, you fail as a viewer because you didn't t tune in right away. Oh. So uh, if you had tuned in oh. at the beginning of the mm -hmm. show, you would oh. know that we had mentioned Outed it. yourself as a not live viewer. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Cobra Commander says, I love, he says, I love, love, uh, double checks, checks better, better than the, the rest, the <laughs> corn, corn, rice, rice, sweet, sweet, crunch, crunch, double, double, crisp, crisp. I think that was just an old Chex commercial. Okay. Got it. Thought, uh, I think the tongue twisters are for me. Yeah, do you want to no try? I, I screwed it up somewhere, I'm sure. Do you want to try that? I, I love, love, double, double Chex, Chex, better, better than, than the rest, than, than the, the rest, rest, corn, corns, rice, 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 sweet, sweet, crunch, crunch, double, double, double crisp, crisp. That is hard. Yep. Um, okay. And then well, Cobra I, Commander I says, failed. bite, bite, munch, munch. Nice. Yep. Miss that part. Part we needed. Yep. Uh, we're just gonna hang out. I, yeah. uh, uh, Olivia Claire says, "Damn, Brett, telling us how it is." Yes, yes. Put him in their place. We are, in fact, a a channel, Damn. right? Yeah. Yeah. We're a pop culture channel. <laughs> Totally. Uh, see, guys, what the problem is, is like, you don't know everything, nor do you, you know, have interest in everything. So everybody thinks that what they're interested in is the most important thing in the world. So when you don't necessarily, when you don't cover the stuff that they want you to cover, they get very angry and tell you you're not doing your job right. I mean, the fact that some people think Taylor Swift isn't pop culture mm -hmm. is just still kind of insane to me. <laughs> Uh, one from, uh, I can't read the whole username. Mary Morgan swore something. I, I can't read it. It says live Batman. on air. Live on air. Yeah. No. Batman don't kill black Adam. Well, I do. Yeah. I did say that in the movie. <laughs> that was, that line was really cringy. Overdressed says one whole film review in pretentious artist voice from you guys, please. What was the pretentious? I, I don't even remember. What was the pretentious artist post we were, uh, voice we were doing? What was the, it? It's, it's okay, guys. <laughs> like okay. So what, what? What is our next movie review? What are we going to be reviewing next? Do we have any um, anything in the pipeline? 
There's got to be something coming out. Uh, I believe um, uh, the movie about the stunt guy comes out soon, right? Fall Guy is coming out. Not Fall. Is that what it's called? That's what it's called. Free Guy You thought fall it was guy, Free yeah. Guy because that's the one about fall, the dude in the fall, video yeah. game. Fall Guy is coming out soon. Maybe we do the whole movie about meta humor in Hollywood. <laughs> and we talk about uh, the artistic integrity of meta stories within the Hollywood structure, you know? Because you have to both rise up and uh, raise up your elevate and elevate your material while also being willing to gri- give harsh critique on all all that is your own industry. This is a little bit too realistic. If I'm we disturbed. don't do that, can we even call ourselves artists? This is amazing. <laughs> Taxi Platty said, Brett, you look handsomer today. Take that, Liv. Well, that, yeah, uh, okay. Yes, well, I look handsome every day, so I don't know what you're saying, but thank you. I, I do. Well, I handsome do is really just this patriarchal yeah. concept like that it. there's an objective standard of what's handsome, when in reality, it's all relative and... That's also, hi, Olivia. Yes. That, that's the reason why we want to hire like ugly people for our movies, because really our job as artists is to <laughs> criticize the status quo. And if you're not pushing back, Whoa. are you really speaking truth to power if you're not putting butt ugly people in your movies? Shane H. Wilder said, Catholic does appear in the Bible in the Greeks, Acts 931, as Catholicos or on the whole. Okay, yeah. But it's translated that way in English, not as yeah. the word Catholic. Got mm-hmm. it. Got it, dude. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I'm going to make a movie about this, I think, right? And that, no. Okay, I'm Please. done. Please. <laughs> Spare me the pretentious <laughs> artist voice. It would be great to do to do all movie reviews where Mary just does it in her regular voice, and I just transform into just the worst person ever. I mean, that's already me most of the time, but I, try, I transform into an even worser person. So, all right, we have gotten the sixth crisis party, ladies and gentlemen. Oh Are we ending God. the poll yet? Uh, we will, oh, yeah, let's go ahead and do this uh, right now. Let's uh, end the poll, and it looks like I was correct, ladies and gentlemen, though it was a very close one. It looks like 51% of you say that Batman should not kill villains. I guess the conversation we had about it convinced people the other way. Yeah. The only this time is incorrect. It looks like you lost. This is objectively incorrect. That is, uh, I mean, they still have a missing one percent there. Now, you now, never know where that goes. Now you have to get on the whatever show and talk about how women don't understand comics. <laughs> Serenko Production said, as much as I disagree with Aiden on Twitter, I'm always glad when he's on PCC. Hope you come back soon. LOL. <laughs> At this, this rate, I probably time. will be back soon. <laughs> <laughs> this, this one is the one that convinced you you're done. Yeah, no, it's I, I got people called me uh, called me silly and biased in the comments, so I'm going to be mean and run away now. In regard to what? Uh, the, the Christmas thing. Oh. <laughs> Out of all the things. Right? I'm so, I'm like, so, no, Ian's I'm so hurt. Ian's mushroom theory is right. <laughs> Ian's Siberian yurt mushrooms. theory is, is actually the real origin of Santa Claus. I'm just picturing now just Superman, or Bat, or, uh, Superman, Batman, uh, Santa Claus just tripping balls on mushrooms while flying the sleigh. Yeah. Let's go. That's Santa Inc. too. Can you get fooies? Uh, like, um, like, like a DUI, you get a, like a flying under the influence with Santa. He's above know? the law. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Literally in favor. Yeah, how's Santa way. dealing with the FAA? That's my question. That's, well, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the thing, right? They always put that track. That's around. NORAD. That's NORAD. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, if you want to follow me, you can follow me on Instagram and on Twix at Brett Dasovic. I'm bravely assuming Mary said it hers yes, already. Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> Usually I ask her twice. Uh, this show is here five days a week, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is noon Pacific. Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Pandora, and Spotify. If you'd prefer to listen rather than watch this show. Uh, and if you want to follow the show on social media, we are on Twix at popculture underscore show, Facebook and not TikTok because we were banned at Pop Culture Crisis. How'd you get banned? Don't know, man. Piss off the feminists somehow. <laughs> Mary pisses off the feminists. I think we're going to get banned for everything we said about vaccines today. Yeah, we might cl- we might skip that part. <laughs> uh, and on Instagram, guys, at Pop Culture Crisis Pod. Guys, we will be back with another episode on Monday. We'll see you There's then. There's one more chat. Oh, oh. go for it. Cobra Commander said, We the chat don't hold any true ill feelings against any of you. Mostly it's just heckling. <laughs> They love love you too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you do the stupid heart thing that Jacob Alordi did. Yes, yes. With that being said, guys, we'll be back with another episode on Monday. Later, Bye. guys.